What do you want? Lucine managed to choke out. What do you think I want, princess? The demon appeared almost offended. I want you to set me free. I thought we had. Lucine protested. Reverend Isabella sent you to another dimension. What happened? You know what happened, damn it! He growled before composing himself. Isabella's a hack. Instead of sending me to another dimension, all she did was trap me between the layers of this one. First of all, how you doing? <laughs> good. How are you doing? Good. A little sore. I went kayaking yesterday, but it was good. I got my nature fix. And it's only my second time kayaking in a very long time. So um, I met up with my friend. Now, have you ever been kayaking? No. Uh, okay. No. <laughs> have no. you been canoeing in a canoe? No, I've been on a ferry. <laughs> okay. All right. So you've not been in anything where you had to manually paddle. <laughs> no. No, I've not. Not even a rowboat. I've been in a rowboat, but I didn't row it. I was a kid. Okay. Yeah, okay. so I haven't I haven't done any of this kind of carry on. No. Gotcha. I can tell by the way you're doing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing it well. I'll tell you what, I've never been skiing, and every time I say I've never been skiing, everybody's like, "You've never been skiing?" Like, like it's the biggest shock. So I will not be shocked that you haven't been in a kayak because you know. Okay, and I but I have been skiing, so. Okay, so you've got one up on me. Yeah. But anyway, it was nice. So it's I'm a little sore from that. And then after uh, I went with my friend Elsie and she's like, well, let's go to the preserve and climb the tower because there's this nature walk and tower. So you can look down and see the waterway and you see all the kayakers where we just were. So then I was climbing up there and I'm like hoping I get credit for it because I have my fitness ring. I'm like, this better, this battery better not die because I want my steps for this. <laughs> what does the fitness ring do? Oh, it counts your steps. It's um, similar to a Fitbit, but I don't like a Fitbit on my wrist when I'm trying to type. So yeah. it has a sensor. I don't know if you can see it in there, but it's got a sensor. So it manages, it um, will check your heart rate. It'll check your body temperature. It will tell you whether you're getting sick. Like if you're stressed, it will actually send you an indicator that, hey, you should probably rest today. It will tell you how good your sleep was. Um, yeah, it's pretty fancy. Well, wow. okay. And and it says you're okay for, for the chat? For, for yeah. It's, okay. Right, okay. It says right. I'm excited and happy to see you, which is true. It actually says that? Yeah, it does. Wow, so it's far beyond a mood ring. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> did you, you didn't see the email I just sent you, did you? Yes, I, 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 but look, I don't understand what's gone on. All I know is it's, Chat GP, let me open it up now. Chat GPT, which just this is something else. I've heard the thing people talk about it, but I'm yeah. such a luddite, I don't know what it is. I didn't know till yesterday. So, John told me about it before, but to be fair, John's a tech geek and he tells me about lots of things that I'm kind of like, hey, okay, that's nice, <laughs> you know, because he has his tech friends and they so he mentioned this chat gpt and he said it's it's this ai where he asked it you know write me a meditation for um i forget what type of meditation for whatever we and it wrote an actual script and i said ha ha that's really great it'll put writers out of work <laughs> so it creates it. it's not like um like google or a voice assistant where it just connects to something that's already been created it creates from scratch Exactly. And and then yesterday, my friend Elsie's asking me if I used it. And I'm like, you know, I, I thought it was the same thing. So I just had a chance to look it up while I was getting ready for this call. I had a few minutes. So I, I'm starting to research. And I thought, well, rather than saying, you know, OK, Google, show me academic resources for how journaling helps with anxiety, because it's for a program I'm creating. And if I go too much down a rabbit hole, just tell me to shut up. No, it's OK. And so it's a, it, and I said, show me academic references. And it's like, research, 2006, and it actually has it, um, the citation, and then it gives me the abstract. And then in 1996, they found this and the abstract. And I'm like, that, that was like a half an hour's worth of work with me just saying, show me this. So it was almost like having a personal assistant go get the research, where normally you do Google, and then you have to click through the links and see what's valuable and what's not. 
Mm -hmm. So because I'm a goofball, five minutes before, I was like, okay, I got five minutes to call. <laughs> I said, write me a story about Graham Mack winning the world's best audiobook award in 250 words. That's all I wrote. You can see that's exactly what it I wrote. wrote it, it wrote 250 and it wrote a story of me going up and picking up an award, which I hope is a kind of a premonition, seeing as I was nominated for another one today. Yeah. Wow. I was nominated for the... Well, it was weird today because I got, I, you know, maybe there's something wrong with me, but I have a Google alert set for my name. So that if something <laughs> shows up on the web, it, I get an email and it says Graham Mack. And often, often it's people called Graham Mack who are not me that have done something outstanding. I think I was a professor of an American university about a year ago. I was just oh, appointed nice. or something. Yeah. Um, so... I got one. This, I woke up and I opened up the computer and said, oh, you, you think, Graham, oh, oh, yeah, this will be another one of those things that really isn't me. Clicked on it and it said the shortlist has been announced for the New York Radio Awards 2023. And in the audiobook category, it's these people. And then it listed a book that I've done and my name. Now, I did enter the New York festivals radio awards because i do every year from the days i was in radio and i've stopped entering in radio categories and for the first time i entered in an audiobook category even though it's a radio awards but they must figure oh it's near enough radio um they're allowed and i thought well that's weird because last week i got a message from new york awards saying this is the shortlist and i clicked the link and i wasn't on it and i thought oh well i've missed out well no big deal you know if you you know uh, yeah. At least I was in the raffle kind of thing. Yeah. So I thought that's odd. So I emailed them and said, look, there is a website out there, posted an article, which must be based on a press release from you that says I'm shortlisted, but on your site. And I looked again and I'm not on the shortlist. So yeah. what gives? But it names the book that I entered. So I don't know what was going on. So I emailed them. And then after I emailed them, I Googled, um, I Googled my name and looked at last year. And sure enough, I was nominated for Best Digital Radio Presenter. So I looked at the year before, and I was nominated then for Best Digital Radio Presenter. And they didn't tell me. These were award ceremonies I could have gone to, and clearly <laughs> not won, but I had an excuse to go. They were in Vegas. And you've done a little schmoozing, maybe increase your chances of winning if you don't win. Well, I could, year. yeah, I could, <laughs> I could shorten the odds. Yes. Yeah. Bribery, corruption, anything like that. <laughs> and... Uh, so I sent them all this in the email, so then they emailed back, and it was the head person, who I won't name. And she said, yes, you were informed about this, and here's a copy of when you were informed. You were informed last year when you were uh, shortlisted, and you were informed. And she sent me these copies of these things, and it was to one of the producers at Virgin Radio UK in London. And... I a message about it. I said, I've never worked for Virgin Radio. And I think they've got me confused with Graham Norton, who does. <laughs> and I've somehow ticked off, have we? So this is for the third year running. I have been nominated wow. for a New York. This is, your, this is your year. Not a chance. Because <laughs> if I was in with the running, I would have, they would have remembered me and put me on the damn shortlist. I'm on the shortlist now if you go on the website, but only because I complained that I wasn't. And somehow my name had got to this thing. No, I'm, I'm a shortlist. I'm not going to win. I can't. But anyway. But yeah. Right, so so now what's, I'm, that one, what's that one? After I do the next audio book, can I submit? Yeah. Can that, submit. One, that one, um, they take submissions in i think from about september and the awards is in april this year actually the, the awards this year are online on the 18th of april at 6 p.m eastern time but what's new york. the name of the award it's called new york festival international okay. awards and they do like advertising i think they might do film they do radio and there are audiobook award categories i was in for solo but what if you would if you if you'd done a duo um, well, that's audio the thing. Book. And, and that's a different category. Guidance, with your guide, is it? With your guidance mm. on this really fancy mic, by the way, I'll tell you about. Should are we recording? I mean, no, should of I course. Be, like prepare for the interview. <laughs> no, we're, we're, this, this could be part of the interview if it's this fun. Who knows? Okay. Yeah. Who this knows? Is probably better because once I know they, it's recording, uh, then I just yeah. Then we'll clam up. Yeah. Yeah. So what about um, the mic then? 
I had, so this is the, remember you did uh, an interview with Ishkia and you were trying to, you were talking about getting the microphones synced up. Yes. So they sound the same. Yeah. Right. And I noticed as much as I love the books we've done before, you could hear a difference between my mic and your mic. And OK, for, just after- to bring people up to speed uh, in case this does make it into the final cut of the interview, uh, the Data Collectors trilogy, which has just come out, it's that the it's a box set of the three Data Collectors books. Uh, you went in and re-recorded the, the female pieces for the first two books and the third one we did. And you're in Florida I'm 30 miles north of London, and we made out that we were in the same room. But yes, the whole yeah. trick to making that work is that we so we both sound as if we're in the same room, is if we both use the, a, a very similar mic so that there, there isn't a huge difference. Yes. Right. So, and okay, we can do a shout out for Ishkia Page's work. Because uh, I've so done that with her too. That's, yeah. how I, that's how I figured it out, um, thanks to you talking about it. And... What's interesting about, so anyway, my point is we'll sound more in sync. So this would be the book, this next one that we're going to do uh, yes. to submit. So just give me a list of like whenever, if you want any. Sure. Words well, that one, the, the ones, the ones I know about, the ones I know about, and I've only just found out about the, the audio book ones, the New York radio awards I knew, but this year I discovered they had an audio book category. So I thought, oh good, well, I know how they work. So that's the New York Festivals Awards, okay. and they ha- they're called New York Festivals. They're based in Manhattan. Uh, I uh, let let me brag for a second. Hold on a second. Let, let, let me quickly brag. Uh, I'm going to come <laughs> back in a second. I've been um, shortlisted many, many times, maybe five or six times. I don't know for my life in radio. But one year, uh, I actually got a trophy. Look at that, baby. Oh, I think that is the nicest looking broadcast trophy. Now, they've changed the trophies now. The trophies now look more like a Manhattan skyline. But I still think this is my favorite version. Yeah. And this was for uh, Best Radio Personality Local Market. That's um, like a 1920s mic. I like that better. Yeah, I but it's really them. heavy. It's, this is heavy too. It's like, but it's kind of Oscar-esque as well, you know, the way you hold well, it. Show and... it on the screen. If there's a murder in your town, they're going to come looking for you. They're like, it's yeah, it's pretty back. lethal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a- anyway, anyway, and I've been to the, I'd been to the awards ceremony in Manhattan once. Oh. <laughs> I was... I was, it was the first time and I was nominated and I was so excited to go. And I sat there in this room and I sat there with a New Zealander who was from, uh, it was not long after the Christchurch earthquake and they won an award for their coverage of the Christchurch earthquake. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there were some real cool people in the room and um, I was nominated and I didn't win an award. And when you're nominated, you get a certificate. But if you show up to the awards, the certificate is on a is on a plaque. It's basically, you know. Okay. So I rang Julie. I went on my own, and I rang Julie from the hotel room the next day. And she said, "How did you go?" I said, "I didn't win. I just got a certificate." She said, "What did you win, though?" I said, "A plank of wood." <laughs> <This is laughs> plank of wood. But in the in the room, everybody at my table had one of these, and I had a plank of wood. <laughs> and I was really embarrassed because I looked like an underachiever. And at the end, they, you know, they take your photo and they say, oh, we want to get one of everybody together. Can everybody get together here with the, the logo and stuff? The New York, well, we're on the top floor of the skyscraper with Manhattan skyline. I mean, it looked beautiful. And I decided not to go and get my photograph taken. And I decided, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to win one of those trophies and I'm going to come back next year and get one of those trophies. And the next year, I won that, right? <laughs> but, but in between getting the um, plank of wood and winning this, which was for the same radio station, the radio station that I was on fired me and I was out of work and couldn't afford to go to New York and they posted <laughs> me this. So, I've, so although I, I have been and I have won, I haven't actually picked up the trophy there. Anyway, and then they moved it to Vegas during the NAB 
And now it's been online since uh, COVID. And I don't know why it's online this year. There's no excuse, but, but they are online. But anyway, New York Festival's awards. Now, there are two British uh, awards, which I don't know whether you'd be eligible for, but you might be. Um, okay. And they're voiceover awards, but they have audiobook categories. And one of them is the, and I entered for the first time this year, it's called the One Voice Awards. If you Google the One Voice Awards yeah. London, and I'm nominated in as a finalist for, for that. And that's on May the 13th. The other one, which hasn't come round yet, but I know is a big one, is another voiceover awards in London, and that's called the Vox Awards, V-O-X. Okay. Well, I just ignore. I there are there are two, but there are two big American ones that you need to know about. Two big okay. ones. The biggest of them all is the Grammys, and I don't know how you enter that. But there is an audiobook huh. category at the Grammys, and I know that because when I interviewed, is my name dropping moment now. When I interviewed Alan Alda, he told me he he was up for a, a Grammy when he. Um, when he 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 voiced his own um, autobiography or one of the he, he did okay. two never have your dog stuffed another one he was up for that and he was beaten on the night by Barack Obama who had voiced his own audiobook of his book okay. and I said I said to Alan Alda in the interview <laughs> so you mean Alan Alda an actor with the, with all this experience who even trains actors was beaten in an acting competition by an amateur. <laughs> His answer was, Barack Obama is hardly an amateur. But anyway, yeah. So the Grammys is one, but I don't know how you enter the Grammys. The other one is one that uh, you enter, and it's called the Audis. And I think okay. Whoopi Goldberg is hosting it this year. I think. Her name has been linked to it. I don't know. And it's the Audis. And that's that's that will be opens, opening soon, I think. Uh, but the big American ones are the Grammys and the Audis. There is another one called the Earphone Awards, and I messaged them a few weeks ago, and it was through some magazine. And I said, how do you enter? And he said, no, you don't enter. We just, if we review it and we like it, we pick one. Okay, so I don't know how that one works. But yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But the Audis is, I, I know that the Audis, the, the next one I will be entering will be um, either Vox or Audis, whichever the, the next one is. Uh, that okay. comes up because yeah, uh, yeah. I don't mind if you don't care I would nominate you for the ones in Britain just but it's my book if you win sure. it's because of my book I'm just as happy as if I but the, the British ones you might be able to enter from overseas they may even have an overseas category I don't know like the Audis is international anyone can enter from anywhere in the world it's not it's not restricted so I don't know I don't I don't okay, I don't know if I'm only learning the, about these because I really don't know, as you know, I've only been doing this now three years. I'm still learning. And I don't really, I don't speak, I don't think I've ever spoken to another audiobook narrator. I, I know someone who's a voiceover. Really? No, I don't even know him. I don't even know. And it's a bloke that comes into Julie's shop is an actor. I've never met him, but I've seen his work. And I'm going to meet him on the 13th at the One Voice Awards because he's also nominated but I think he voiced uh, an animation or, or a video game or something because uh, these are voiceover awards. So that world of voiceover uh, and even the wor world of audiobook narration, I'm not really in it yet. <laughs> really? Like 200 books, not in it yet. It's huh? only 167 at the moment. It's okay, not quite 200. Not 167 in three years. You're yeah. such a slacker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm too busy recording books to be schmoozing. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so what were you anyway, saying about the mic? That the. Uh oh yeah, I forgot. I've got <laughs> Sorry, I. I've got my yeti yeah. on this side. I love yeah. <laughs> we're so fancy in the south. So, um, at your suggestion, John, my husband, gifted me this mic, and the Electro like Voice RE twenty. Yeah. So in the which first... is the mic that's in pretty much every radio station in the U.S. Yeah. So in the first book we did of the cozy mystery, if I didn't care, you did the main narration and all the male character voices, except for a couple that I had my husband do. Right. So for the second one, I said to him, you know, then the first book, 
the minor character, you know, was kind of Officer Dennis was in the background. Emma Post was in the background. In this book, now they're the lead characters, which means this is the first time I have to make a lead character. What happened to Officer of Ortega? What a, you, that's you. I know, but you said that he's now in the background. Have I been demoted? No, he's no, he's not. He's a oh, main you, character. Okay, fine. All right. But the, you said oh, the ones in the background, oh, they're coming into the front as well. I, okay. I thought they were replacing him, the way you said it. Okay. We would, <laughs> wow, but I'm glad you are that have that emotional connection. I am that insecure, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, so here's how it works. In the first book, with If I Didn't Care, you had Rue and you had Darwin, and they were the main characters. And Emma yes. Post and Officer Dennis were kind of minor characters. Yes. And Ortega actually was was kind of borderline. He was a supporting role. In this book, you'll be happy to know he has a main role. Great. <laughs> and but so does Officer Dennis. And I said to John, you know, with your work schedule, do you have time to record this with me? Because when we did it that the last time, it was like within a couple of hours. I just had him re run through the lines and then I cut them in tediously, as we talked about. So this time I said, you know, let's give it a try with this mic just sit like really close to me and like he he has a more booming resonant voice so i had him sit a little further away and i was a little bit closer and we ran through a scene that was just he he his character and emma played around with the sound put it through the acx check and you listen to it and it sounds really good like without right. now i didn't i didn't do the you know how you um if you make a mistake, you drop in on Audacity, you do the cut and you- The punch and roll, yeah. Yeah, I don't do that because that would have taken us too long and I didn't want to take up all of his weekend because he's doing me a favor, I think. But anyway, even though I think it's kind of fun. So, but what we did do was run through the scene and if we goofed up, we just pause and keep going. So I'll go back and listen and cut, but that's still far less time than me taking the two things and putting them together. Yes, and it's right. from a separate session, yeah. Right. So that I thought was pretty darn cool. And then with you recording on the same mic, if you're still willing, because you're so busy now and and I'm it's always time for you, Daniel, <laughs> always time for you. I, you know, and then I figured I would, as much as I love the editing, try to <laughs> do cut your voice in. But see, if you were neighbors, if you just moved here or we moved to the UK, we could like sit in the same room, just like a cartoon animation, and we could all read our lines and then cut, be done. Yeah, that would be fun, like doing a radio play. Yeah. I would love to have that kind, you know, that's very pie in the sky, but I would love to have that kind of budget to be just like, Graham, we're going to meet in London. This, this is our team of voice actors. Have it all lined up. Have it, you know, and then, you know. What, what will happen is eventually... The books will sell so well, and you will become the J.K. Rowling of audiobook narrators and writers. Okay. Apart from the, you won't get into trouble over the trans thing, right? No. Just professionally, no. you will be of that status. And people will pay money to go to a huge venue, maybe the Royal Albert Hall, and uh -huh. see the book performed from start to finish live with people doing live sound effects and like an old fashioned radio play and people will pay to see that. I'd pay to see that. If I had a favorite book that was an audio book and I loved it, just like going to see a band on the road when you love their album, yeah. wouldn't you want to go and see the players do it live in front of you? That would How be cool, cool would that be? That would be super cool. Maybe a yeah. reduced, a modified script, not maybe not the entire book. Like okay, second. maybe yeah, or or maybe or maybe uh, yeah, yeah. Wow, That'd see, be, uh, this is why Chat GPT will never. Am I saying it right? Yeah, Chat GPT will never replace a human because your story right there was already better than what they generated. <laughs> <laughs> so this Chat GP, this sounds like another time wasting website to me. Would I be right? No. Not okay, so I only have exactly like five minutes of experience with it, right? But have you found I, a use for it? Are you, are you going to give it whole chapters and sections of books to work on? Well, and no, in that case, I, where are we on copyright? Who owns the work? 
I was just if the if that. the AI creates it, but the AI is not a person, so therefore the AI cannot own it. Do the people who own Chat G I know. I had that exact, own it? Yeah, I had that exact question. So if everybody is asking the same questions and generating blog content, and without just looking at it, I mean, you have to edit and and fix it up. But if they're doing that, then are there copyright? That was my exact question. Now. As a writer, I don't want somebody else writing my books for me, even if they could. I'd like to think I do a little better job than AI, at least so far. For some people, it might help, which is a really mean thing to say, but there's, if you're an exceptionally bad, but here's where it's useful. Right before this call, I'm trying to do academic research for two different programs that I'm creating, and I want to know about the benefits of journaling and writing for and in, in narrative therapy and how it helps people with stress and trauma and like PTSD and why it, not just that it's beneficial, it makes you feel better, but why and what's the research, right? So as I started saying at the beginning when we started chatting, I normally go to Google and say, show me academic research. I'd go to like Harvard, EDU and some other sites and just kind of dig through and find stuff that's no good. You need to pay, get past the paywall, like it would take a long time. You've got to Long filter out the irrelevant stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And so that could have, you know, that might be an, I take a lot of time in research because I want to see everything that's out there. So granted, this will take me a little more time than the five minutes I spent. But I just said, I wrote in, you know, show me academic citations and research that shows that journaling is beneficial for stress reduction. And within five seconds it gave me three case studies from 2006 and two others and they said in this study 145 participants blah 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 in the university of whatever found this and here were the benefits and i'm like so as far as having your own research assistant that is pretty freaking fantastic and it's free yeah well there's i think there's a paid version but I, okay. I, like I said, that's all I know. So I would not be using it really to write a story, but I would be using it to, to like do the research for me because that could save me a couple hours every time I sit down to try to look something up. So, But it could yeah. help write a blurb if you had a press release to put out or something like that because you could give it just enough of the work and it could, it could make at least the bare bones of a of a press release or if somebody said you know can you yeah. give me a bio or a quick or something you know or uh, character right. definitions or stuff like if you if you wanted to turn um any of your books or a series of books into a tv show then the tv people would say well we need an outline of each character it could help you write that which could take a long time to do couldn't it because you could just Under. give it what <laughs> I wonder, could what? you do take the data collectors, right? So this is yeah. the book we're talking about. By the way, I don't know if you know how big this book is. That's like a This is the three, this is this is the trilogy, which is one. which is out yeah. now. It's only just come yeah. out and it's out in audio book too. That's a yeah. lot of writing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, if you could take that and put like I wonder if you could put a chapter into uh chat gpt and say turn this into a screenplay what would what would it kick a out screenplay yes yes and write it in the format of a screenplay as well with the dialogue right. and then, here and yeah, that it looks messy but it pulls out all the text and then maybe you clean it up i don't know yeah yeah and then you can uh, then you can uh, submit a screenplay maybe but and then the yes and then the other thing you were talking about with like the press release and stuff um, supposedly you can optimize your website. So if you have a blog, I don't know how to do it yet. Um, you can have that suggest keywords to put into your text so that people find your website. Oh, well, with Google, um, what do they call it? Search optimization. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's potential, you know, I don't know. How, uh, my first thought was, you know, how many writers and this is going to put out a work. And then my second thought was what you said, how many people are getting sued for... <laughs> Plagiarized just, copy. Yeah, yeah, um, but I, I suppose you, you, you're going to change it anyway. You're going to put your own polish on it when you're not going to put it out just as is. So, and as long as you've changed it enough, I don't. I, I suppose yeah. it could be argued. But for but the then, record, I'm not writing any books using Chat No, <laughs> no. And I'm actually disappointed that that now it's not another time wasting website because it, I could add another word into my joke about time 
waste. It's not actually my word. It's not my joke. I yeah. saw a joke on Conan O'Brien years ago, and his joke was this, and I've just added to it along the way. And his joke was um, something along the lines of uh, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and Facebook are going to combine into one giant time-wasting website, and they're going to be called You Twit Face. Well, I've <laughs> extended that now and said, uh, wouldn't it be great if YouTube, Spotify, Twitter, and Facebook combined into one giant time-wasting website called You Spotty Twit Face? <laughs> <laughs> but now I could go, wouldn't it be great if YouTube, Spotify, ChatGPT, Twitter, and Facebook combined into one giant saving, and they would be, are you, are you ready for it? Have I got it? Do, do you have it or do you want to put it into ChatGPT and see what no, it comes up? No, I, I've got it. Let me just see. I think it would be... You spotty, chatty twit face. <laughs> but it's not going to be a waste of time, so I can't do that anyway. Right. Yeah. We should no, talk. I, I, I actually spend very little time. People ask me, like, I tell them, if you want to hear, and I don't like text either. It's like, if you want to hear from me, either send me an email or pick up the phone or we'll make plans to get together. People send me text and then. They'll say and they'll send a Facebook message and then finally I'll get a message on Twitter that'll say, did you see my Facebook message or did you see my whatever? And I'm like, no, like I will see a, a text message like three days later. So if it's an emergency, pick up the phone and call me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was once told um, at a radio station, they, they did some, they, they ask you some questions and they look the way your eyes look, that one, you looked whatever, to see how much of your, operating system was auditory how much was visual how much was kinetic or whatever and i was the highest uh, auditory they'd ever seen and i said well i oh. work in radio doesn't it make sense well what uh, does that yeah. mean how do they measure it because I, I don't know they ask you a few questions yeah. like if this or this or this or this or whatever and apparently if you look up to one side it means something and you, if they, it could have been bs i don't know but they they tested you they had they were proper shrinks and they they just because i was in management at the time yeah. and they were they were doing i was a program director of a station they were trying to do this thing how you know the people who you work for you should work out what their preferred methodology is you know yeah, and the, yeah. there were little easy ways if somebody says something that says visual visual if somebody says i hear what you're saying then they're more auditory than if they go i see what you mean uh, yeah. By and large, um, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's yeah. a lot of you know, and uh, and I'm curious, kind of curious about that because I know they used to say if you look this way, it means you're you're researching something in your brain from your memory. If you look this way, you're trying to create, so you might be lying. And I'm like, okay, well, right, yeah. For, how does that work for Zoom where it's not mirrored? So when you look this way, it's really <laughs> looking that way. <laughs> yeah. And then you're paranoid that you're going to look in a direction like I always do this when I'm thinking. I always look to the side to think about it because if I look at you while I'm trying to think, I can't do two things at once. <laughs> yeah. I can either pay attention to what you're saying or I can think about what I want to say. But I've been told I'm visual because I tend to if I'm talking about something, I'll be like, OK, this is over here and this is here. And I like map it out like I can see it in front of me. And apparently not a lot of people do that. <laughs> Right. Okay. No, I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't take any note. I didn't take any notice of it. Uh, it really didn't. Didn't help me in any way at all. <laughs> okay. But, but but we know uh, if we need to get in touch with, with you. Um, well, you do well with email. So you no. Know. Well, I actually, when I'm working on an audio book with an author, they all have their own different styles, and I let them do whatever they want. And usually, the usual way is. You know, if they want to change something or whatever, we do it through the messaging service on ACX if I'm doing the book through ACX. And I kind of like it that way because it's all written down. It's like the chapter number, the time that it happens, what I recorded, what it should have said or what if there was in, what inflection or whatever. And I've got it and I can sit there and I can kind of go through it and tick it off. I like that. And with the time difference as well, with, with authors being, you know, mostly in the United States, it's much easier yeah. if I wake up to some messages that I can read through. And then while they're in bed, I'll fix them, put them up. And then when they yeah. wake up, they can, and then overnight they can. So for the record, I shouldn't send you an email. I should go on ACX and type you a 
message. Females are fine too, but but also I used to get quite stressed about it when I first started. It's like, yeah, someone's bogging me down on this, and I because I've got all this other, and I could be doing this, and I could. And at the end of the day, I go like, gee, I didn't even get a whole finished hour done today because I was doing all that other stuff when I could have done like three finished hours and been really, you know, on the gravy train, you know, you know, and like it, the you know, second data collected, like breach of contract. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I used to get stressed out about it. But I've worked because it was new. But now I've worked out some stuff takes a long time. Some stuff takes a long time. Some stuff some stuff is just money for jam. Straight reads about history or business or whatever, they're money for jam. And I charge the same whether it's a fiction book or it's yeah. a straight read about butterflies, I charge the same rate. And so I figure they're going to kind of even themselves out. And so I right. just don't worry about it, knowing that, okay, this one's taken a long time. And, you know, so now I just don't worry about it. I just get on with it. And whatever the yeah. author needs, I do. Whatever they need. And if they go, can you re record that whole chapter? Okay. As long as you tell me what it is you, that was wrong with it and I'll do it. And I just get on with it and I don't worry. Because I know what will be coming down the pike soon, as you Americans say, coming down the pike, you say that. Um, what will be coming along soon will be a book that's like a six-hour book that I can do in like 12 hours. You know, it will come down. I mean, yeah. and that happens. And so I just don't worry about it as long as I charge the same. I mean, maybe I should have different rates, but I don't. I have the, the same rate for everybody. Well, then and, you have uh, to, if yeah. you do different rates, you kind of have to take the time of saying, okay, this is probably going to take X amount of time. And then you have to give them a scope. Like what I'll do with projects, sometimes I'll tell them this could take 15 to 25 hours. You don't know. At least right. with what you're doing, they know exactly what to expect at the end. Yeah. So, yeah. It's hard to say. So, yeah, it is fun. So, let's talk about the Data Collectors trilogy. Um, this, this book then was really recorded twice, wasn't it? Because you went back in and reproduce yeah. the first two books. The first one. Okay, so you did the second one and then what do we do for the third one? I think you did the But did third did one. I did I do all I don't did I I did the female voices in the first one, but then right. in the second and one did I did I did you do them? You did the female voices in the, the second. I did the female voices in the second one. Oh, okay. And that right. was the I think the first time that you you had made the mistake of offering <laughs> to narrate with me on an interview and me being Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it sounded like fun. Yeah. So me being the opportunist said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I took it so seriously. I went and downloaded all these different accent help so I could learn to do some different voices, which was, which was helpful and difficult because then I realized when I got to the next book, I was like, darn it, the voices that were really hard and terrible, I have to do again. But anyway, and then after that, I was like, well, you know, when we did the third one, we did it the same way. And I'm like, okay, I want some consistency. Now the first book has, you know, just you doing the female voices. So I don't think I'm a super perfectionist, but I thought it would sound nice if we had female voices throughout. So I went back in and recorded and you opened up the files and then I went in and just cut my voice in with limited yeah. success. Like, I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. No, I wouldn't say I think it worked. Yeah. It worked, didn't it? I think I got better. Well, I got better at it. It was definitely, you know, because you've got your, your rhythm. You know what you're doing. That was definitely a challenge for me because I had never fought with ACX and editing and getting everything, you know. But I think it did work, yeah. I mean, we yeah. got a good product at the end. Yeah, and definitely. And it was a great suggestion to compile it. So thank and you And it's, it's worked out, has it? Well, that that worked out because I'd done, I'd done some... Uh, they call them bundles at ACX, and I'd done some bundles before, uh, but I'd done them uh, as for a fee. But there's a there's a series I've done called Goblin Summoner, and I've done those as um, royalty shares. So I get a, a twenty percent royalty uh, payment uh, for yeah. the for the for the books. Uh, no, it, actually, it was it was a guy who written Goblin Summoner. It wasn't the Goblin Summoner series. It was the series called Star uh, Star Commander, and mm -hmm. it was a three book series. And I did it. And so when I do it as a royalty share deal, I can see the sales. And yeah. I started seeing the sales on this thing. And already the bundle has outsold the third book. 
and is on right. its way to outselling the second book. Obviously, the first one in the series always sells more than the other, the other two of a series of three. And I knew we'd done this as a series of three, so I suggested to you, yeah. I said, "You want to do this bundle thing? I think you know yeah. this could I this could go happy well." To do, I am I am proud of his success and happy for you, but I was not you know convinced that it would do how it would do. I didn't know how it would go, so I didn't want you to do a royalty share and be like, "Oh, great." I made five bucks today. You know? <laughs> I, just I, I don't know. Pay you for the but time but when you can, all right, well, I don't want to know the numbers, but when you compare the sales of the bundle so far, and what's it been out about three weeks now, three or four weeks? Uh, some, I think it's only been a couple of weeks. I don't know. I have to look. Okay. Well, how's I it going it, now compared on the sales of the individual I books? Think it's, I think it's the same. It's almost like it's just a new book. Which is not a bad thing. It's an uptick, but it's it's not like hand over fist. It, believe me, if it's if I started selling like millions, I would be cutting you in anyway. I'd be like, <laughs> "Happy birthday, Graham! <laughs> Here's a, we're going to the Grammys." <laughs> Talking a happy birthday. Thank you very much for the voucher that you got me for my birthday way back in. Was it, was it my birthday or my anniversary? Anyway, you got me a voucher, and Perfect. Julie and I used it the other day uh, in London. It was terrific. At, nice. which it, it, And it's even called the Darwin Restaurant, um, which with Darwin being a character in yeah. the um, second book of, uh, second book series, the, the murder mystery type series. So it was kind of cosmic there as well. But thank you. That yeah. was great. Oh, yeah. sure. That's sweet. Yeah. Thanks for sharing photos. But uh, you... what I was – go ahead. No, go on. What I was going to say is the the value in combining the audiobook. I had wanted to bundle the ebook and the print book. I won't go into details of why Amazon annoys me, <laughs> but it wasn't working. And I said to uh, Cindy, who's the publisher who formats for me, I said, "Well, can't we just do one book and just combine it that way?" And she's like, "Well, that's going to be a big book." And so we never did at the time. I said, you know what? Let's do it. Let's put it in as a new ISBN, as an ebook. So I set up the ebook, and they found she found out if I charge at a specific rate, that's less. I actually make more money because if yeah. you raise the rate too much on the ebooks, Amazon takes more. So she's like, if you charge less, you will actually make more. And it's I not see they take a bigger right. Yeah. So she set that up. And then we found out that they were starting, uh, it's kind of a, a beta run on print books. Long story short, it did not work again on Amazon because I'm fighting with them with print books in general, but it worked on Ingram, which is how we have the hardcover. So okay. it kind of breathed life into all three versions. So I appreciate that you suggested compiling it because I don't think I've seen all the ways it's going to benefit yet, but it was a great suggestion. Well, all I know is when, when I spoke to this particular author about this, um, Tracy Gregory, uh, mm -hmm. Star Commander is the series. Yeah. Uh, he said that most audiobooks are not bought by people just buying, paying face value. It's people using their, who are members of Audible and are using their yeah. credit. They spend yeah. in British money £10 a month to, and they can get 12 books a year, one every month. So, if they're going to buy um, a 16-minute children's book, that will cost them £10. Or if they're going to buy a series of three exactly books yeah. with, you know, like whatever, how many hours is it? It's be over 20 it's hours. Like 21 hours? Yeah. For the same <laughs> yeah. price, there's a perceived yeah. better value there. And, it, and, that, yeah. and so you sell, and most of the sales are done that way through Audible. And I didn't know that. I, yeah. And he has, it sounds like he has a really great following, um, so it is, it did, I did see an uptick. I didn't see a huge uptick, but let's see what happens over time. Because the other thing, and this is something that I need to, um, not that I want to bore everybody listening with, with marketing, but I would like to connect with different authors one-on-one -on -one and kind of see what they're doing, what am I doing, what they're doing, what works, and just kind of e even share like what completely failed miserably and what was good. Because yeah. I'm pretty sure me writing in four different genres was probably not the best way to brand myself as an author, but I just wrote what I felt like writing. I don't know. I, I work, I'm working now with uh, an author and I've done eight books with him in the same series and it's a murder mystery series. Mm -hmm. And he's a, when he approached me 
uh, through ACX, but he approached me and said, oh, I see your profile on ACX, you know, and I think you'd be right for these books. Could you, could you audition for me? And I said, yeah, sure. So I'll audition for anybody, you know, I don't care. And they were really, really good books. Yeah. And um, I'm doing them as a royalty share, and they're selling really, really well. I, I would say, I would say I probably make... I probably make half. No, I'd say I make a third of my income every month just from the royalties on those eight books. Ah. That's how good they're going. Um, but anyway, they. I am small potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. No, 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 no. Um, so, but the thing is, he said to me, and it worried me at the beginning because he wanted me to do the first three books without putting them on on ACX, and I thought. Well, if they don't sell, I'm not going to know until book four. Um, oh. You know what I mean? And I could be, yeah. and these were like long, there was like, I think they're about eight hour books each. I could be doing all this work for next to nothing. So I was taking a punt, but I spoke to him on Zoom and everything. And he seemed like a decent guy and he had a nice dog, which Julie said was important. And, <laughs> and the dog was, came on Zoom. And, you were so but, trusting. I don't think I would have done it. But but no, but he's an established author, right? Okay. But but he said to me, when I put these books out, I'm going to use a different name. And I didn't say to anything to him at the time, but I thought, he's this guy with all this form and a following as an established author, and he's going to put these out in a name no one's ever heard of. It's like going back to being a newbie and having to build yeah. a following from scratch. But no. Whatever he does with his marketing, I mean, the books are very good, but yeah. whatever he does with his marketing, he's basically launched as a brand new author and, and they're su work. super sellers. Yeah. Really, really good. Yeah. So you need, to, you need to talk to him. <laughs> you need to talk to him. What's his his name? name is John Weston, but he's writing under the name of Jack Cartwright. Okay. Jack Cartwright. Cartwright I mean, with a W rather than a right. Well, you tell him you talk to me. Tell him we're mates. And then when he checks me out and goes, this Danielle in Florida, is she okay? I'm like, oh, yeah, she's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, you, sh that's... you should you should talk to him because he does know how it works. He knows how it works because he basically launched a, a, a murder mystery series. They're called the Wild Fens Murder Mystery Series. They're good. In fact, you know, oh, this is a good way to get back into this. The New York Award I got nominated for was for one of his books. Yeah. It was about book book five, I think it was, but that nomination and that's, and award. This is his full time thing, so he's not doing other work on the side. Yeah, he's like, a professional he's writer. Yeah, yeah, he's full time gig. Yeah, he's a writer. So that's a that, and that's a thing. I'm very curious talking to different people because some of it, I think, is um, the fact that I have three different careers, and maybe right. if I focused on one, and because I noticed the the writers that are doing really well, they are in it full time. And they have the staff backing them, so you. They have I don't think he has. Him. I might be wrong, but I don't think he has staff backing He's him. He's doing it all himself. Wow. I think so. I don't know, but he knows yeah. how it's done, and he writes a lot. You know, it's like he's done those. He's working on book. No, he's written book nine. That's out in Kindle. He's working on book ten. He's going to give me book nine in a couple of weeks' time. But I've done those eight books in under a year. Uh, yeah. I've audio books, so. He's he's writing them as quick as I can read them. <laughs> you know, yeah. he's he's putting them out there, but and they're good. Yeah, because that would have me curious. Like I said, some of the things that I think are my flaws. Um, like I said, I'm trying to promote myself in three different ways. I'm promoting myself as a coach, and then a writer, and then as a content creator over here, and then I'm writing in four different genres. And a narrator. So and. You know, I it's one of those things. I narrate my own books. Um, I do voiceover stuff for other people, but it's usually projects, educational stuff, not necessarily books. Which yeah, but that's happen. voiceover. Yeah, that's still yeah. voiceover. Work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I I get the sense that I probably need to streamline, which I'm trying to do a little better than I have been. But yeah, he would be an interesting and and people like that if they charged a, even an, a uh, a fee just to talk to them for an hour. Like I'll, you know, consult. Well, you don't need any help like on the, you don't need any help on the writing side of things, but oh, okay. I'm sure he could point <laughs> you in the right direction for how to market yeah. his, his books and his audio books. Cause he knows and what he's doing. If it, 
And he even told me, I spoke to him last week. He even told me, because I'm really pleased with the sales of the audiobooks. Yeah. He said to me, yeah, the audiobooks are lagging, actually. I'm like, what? He's making even more from the real bloody books. Yeah. You know, I'm quite happy with the I sales think it's a, of the audiobook. Number one, it depends on the audience. Um, like, I did better for the, for the first few books on the print and then ebook and then audiobook and now ebooks tend to be get going it so it varies but yeah i guess it depends on who i the audience is and how they consume which i'm i'm guessing he he knows very well i had another thought and i lost it but it it'll come back it might come back <laughs> so. yeah okay well, but we 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 were talking about um copyright Early, you've been looking at licensing music. What's that all about? Oh, jeez. Okay. So we have our mystery, If I Didn't Care. I just happen to like that song. I play it on the piano. And so the first book we lucked out, um, and I didn't even think about it until it came time to do the audio that I wanted to have the character sing a few bars. Well, Once again, for anyone that doesn't know, The Data Collectors is a science fiction. I mean, it's more than a science fiction. It's, it's about... Um, it's about life and trust and all the other things, but it is based in a in in a futuristic science fiction type world. That's the that's where it's based. Is that fair to say? But for those yes. who don't know, I, Data Collectors, which is the one that's a bundle, it's just come out. That yes. is science fiction. But this is totally different. This is was it murder mystery. Would you call it? Would you class it as yeah, that or thriller? Yeah. 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 Murder okay. with Cozy Mystery is good. Not, nothing too terrible. PG-13. So, so what, what's Cozy Mystery then? Okay, so Cozy Mystery usually is um, very low on violence. Uh, it's not super racy. It's, it's you, you know, you, you might have some romance, but it's like I said, PG. Like if you went to the movies, you could take your kids to it. It's not nothing terrible. Okay. You know, most yeah. of the murder happens off screen, and it's usually somebody who deserves it. Not always. But yes. it's not like you're going to get a lot of graphic details in the murder. It's yeah, kind of like the yeah, murder yeah. happened over here. Now let's move on to the story. And yeah. in mine, I, I, because I really like cornball detective stories, and I, I'll watch like on, on TV. Everybody else is watching. I don't even know what everybody else is watching. They're asking me, "Do you watch this and that and the other thing?" I'm like, "No, no, no." But I watch Death in Paradise and, friend, you know, Miss Fisher mysteries. Every mystery series I will watch. But anyway. There was a point to this. Oh, that's what a cozy is. It's just lighter. Because okay. you'd say, you know, there's some romance, there's some comedy. It's a yeah. good story. Yeah, yeah. But it's not, not like like uh, true crime or, you know. Yeah, it's not gritty. It's, you're not going to uh, have nightmares, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. So so back to the music then. Why, why are you licensing music? Okay. So for this one that we're going to be doing, uh, Pennies from Heaven, I thought, so when the first book came out, I was like, as we were doing the audiobook, I'm like, I wonder if I can sing a bar under fair use. So I went and Googled it, and it just so happened that it went in 20, January of the year I released it, 2021, I think it was. Um, 20, I don't remember anymore. There's all The days are blending together. But it was just approved for Creative Commons because the time had passed. So Great. I didn't worry about it. So for this book, Pennies from Heaven, the reason I picked this song uh, not only do I like it, but supposedly my grandfather, who died a year to the day, so I'm born on his death day, basically, um, according to like the Jewish calendar. So I was born 12 days early, and according to the Jewish calendar, my birthday was on his death day, which is supposed to be good luck. Um, but the thing is, I've never met him, and he told my mom, you know, you're going to have a daughter a year after I die. A year to the day and she laughed at him because she's like well the doctor says i can't have any more kids so jokes on you and here i am so anyway supposedly that was his favorite song so i thought well it'd be nice to put it in for book number two you know yeah um never met the man he was a, a apparently a, a boxer and uh, i forget what other work he but he was definitely he was a professional boxer that much i know and something else like working on the docks like a general trade kind of thing but anyway Long story short, I'm putting some of the lines in the book, and I thought, well, knowing that I want you to play 89-year-old Erasmus Vandenberg, I was like, wow, it would be so funny if I got Graham to sing a few lines of Pennies from Heaven with Emma yeah. Post. That would be endearing, and it would be, you know, fun for me. I don't know if it's fun for you. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, because so I did sing in the first book. 
You did. You got to, year. yeah. And we won't even name what you sang because I don't want to get in trouble. But it was <laughs> it was it was just a couple lines, so I think we're fine under fair use. But anyway, um, I happened to look this one up, and it's like all of it was under copyright. So I'm like, well, this is not kind of a thing where you know you ask for forgiveness later if somebody says we're suing you for 15 grand so i yeah. i found a, a site that, that licenses and i emailed and asked them and they said not only do you need a license for the audiobook and uh, and the license is the same kind of license depending on what they negotiate as if i were a singer creating an album so the license might be for 2 years it might be a fee and a percentage of royalties yeah. And then on the it's whatever the side, deal you strike, isn't it? Yeah. And then on the print side, you have to pay for that as well. And I'm like, I don't think it's worth it for we don't know what's going to happen with the book sales. Like, it, you know, if they came back with something reasonable, but it was just a little uh, it did. Not only was it kind of a, a ridiculous price in my mind, the idea that every couple of years I had to renegotiate that. And I've worked in situations where I would pay a royalty to somebody. And what that does is it's not like on ACX where ACX pays you, right? Yeah, the, the author yeah. doesn't have to send you a check. Anytime yeah. I've done it in the past, I had to manually like manage that. And it's a pain because now you're attached to that person like forever. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, so long story short, but I'm and like, not necessarily okay, that person, their family as well. Uh, yeah, well, no. No, I, I, I had an experience of this. My band many years ago, the Graham Mac Blues Band, we uh -huh. did a gig and we played uh, a version of High Heel Sneakers by Tommy Tucker. And I put the oh, video I, I put the video on YouTube and Tommy Tucker's grandson told me to take it down unless I paid him some money. And I went, oh, OK. So I took it down for a week and then put it back up again. And then he found out <laughs> and I got a, uh, a copyright strike from ACX, uh, not ACX, uh, YouTube, uh, which still stands. I get two more strikes, and I'm out. And I, I, but I messaged him back and said, "Look, if you want, if you want, um, you can have a hundred percent of everything this video on YouTube makes because it makes nothing. It's just on YouTube. I'm not getting any money from it. I mean, there's only like a couple yeah. of thousand people have even seen it. I said, so you can have everything if you want, but there's nothing. There's, I'm not making any. I mean, I'm, I totally get it." Yeah. Well, I totally get it. If the artist has done the work and created something and I'm making money from it, then they should get a piece of it. That's fair. But if I'm not making any money from it, why am I paying you? What am I paying you for? And anyway, you didn't write yeah. it. <laughs> anyway, but it might not have even been his grandson. Yeah. So it could be their family. It goes on for years and years. Yeah. yeah. I got a funny story about that if we have time otherwise, because I know we go down these rabbit holes. But <laughs> Another YouTube story. But anyway. So for this story, so what I ended up doing, I was like, okay, but it's essential to the plot to have a little bit of the clue. So I have, I had to change it where he's humming and he maybe, and I have like the, the name of the song without having lots of lyrics. But I was like, I wanted to have that interaction because I guess I really want to hear you sing as 89 year old Erasmus Vandenberg. So yeah. I had to find a song that fit the copyright. Um, and so I came up with, uh, there was a couple, I narrowed it down to it had to be you, but I was like, oh, everybody sings that. And then Bye Bye Blackbird, which I don't hear as often. And a couple of lines from it kind of fit what was happening in the story. And I'm like, that's the one we're going with. So at the Is last Bye Bye minute, Blackbird out of copyright? Yes. The wow. same, the, yeah. So that, so that is now Creative Commons as of, I think, wow. January 2021 as well. Wow. Or maybe 2022. So if you keep looking they'll tell you like this one goes into creative commons and they'll give a date right right so oh anyway. wow so you don't need to license it it's yours to use I do it's everybody to license it. so that so now the third book i had other titles for the third book i'm like it's probably going to be one of those two because i'm like i don't want to have to go through the hassle. yeah yeah no that's a good idea that's a really good idea yeah so you can actually put music in the audio book exactly well that sounds like fun yeah, that's As a good characters. song though. Bye bye Blackbird. Yeah, but that's wow. what's get, that's what's kind of interesting too, because all, in all the books I've done before, the lead character, whether it's um, Rue or Lucine, is just my voice. So yes. now I realize that Emma is a character voice. So now I've got to carry her voice throughout the whole book as the lead, and kind of sing as her. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, that's okay. Be fun. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. You're, you've done this. You've done this all the time. You could do this in your sleep now, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I, what I do when I when I do a book, I I have a, a Google Drive file that I um, and I put the first line when the character appears. I put yeah. that audio in the file so that when the character comes back, because sometimes characters can disappear for a while. And then they come back later. I can go back to the first time it came up and yeah. listen to it, so I know what it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes so, with so, some with some authors, I've actually shared them in as well, so they can approve them before we start, in case they don't like them. Yeah. <laughs> I have to change yeah. them, as, you know. So and that's funny because when you first came back with Darwin, I ha so I have an idea what they sound like in my head, but I can't always yeah. translate that. And it's yeah. funny because when I first heard Darwin's voice. Um, Darwin Fennick from book number one, I was like, I don't know if I like that voice. And I had to get through and I'm like, well, let me give it a chance because I'm thinking what he should sound like. And then by the time I got through the chapter, then he became one of my favorite characters and I liked him the best. But it took me a while because I had an expectation in my head of exactly what he's going to sound like. And it was until I said, well, let me just like, you know, so, so I, because I would have changed it as we went through if you didn't like it. I know. know but the thing is, it that changes it's it's really interesting to me how the audiobook when you put your voice to it changes the whole um production because you put your energy into it so to me now the audiobook version is different than a print version because whoever's reading it when you think about it they're putting their own voice in there you know now i when i'm writing the books i can hear your voice i can hear john's voice um, I can hear kind of what I'm going to sound like, but for the average person, like picking up a book and reading it, they they're hearing these other voices different from the audio, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like if you'd ask an, an illustrator to to illustrate a scene from the book, there's a chance that it might not look like what you imagined. I suppose it's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. yeah, it it never does. <laughs> I mean, okay. <laughs> when, I yeah. mean, you hopefully you get something better. Like when I hired people to do covers for my book you know they're going to take you can describe it all you want but unless they can get inside your head um, yeah it happen with ai at some point but yeah i'm just going to change my earpiece because i'm having some issues with it. i'm going to put some headphones on which might make me look a bit okay. dorky but it means i can hear no. better because am little... i am i talking too loud or too no loud? no no it's not it's okay. this it's this it's this cheap earpiece since my Singapore Airlines earpiece gave up, which I got for nothing on a flight, and I found this one in the bottom drawer. This one's worse than the free one. So, oh well. But uh, so I can hear you perfectly now. Mic, but cheap headphones. I have what? A fancy mic, but cheap headphones. Is that what? Yeah. Yeah. No, these are, these are not. These are the Sony's. These are the. Oh, these, these are, are the, nice. Okay. These are the ones. These are the ones they use. This brand. This, the Sony. MDR seven five zero six. These are the ones that they use on TV. You know when you see someone on TV or movies holding the boom, mm. and they've yeah. got they've always got this brand. Don't know why, uh, but they always use that brand or that particular model. I've gone yeah. through. I forget what these are, but I've gone through two pairs and they get shredded. And I don't. And they're not near the cats. I don't know how they just fall apart. I I like these. I I think I think I sound good in these. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because that's my thing. Look, let let me be the voice in your head. That's Aww. my uh, that's my Wait, thing. Where can I buy one of those? I, well, I got them made. Them I I could do, but I got them made. Um, it's a company in G Germany, and yeah. you, uh, you can have whatever you like. So we can all buy. So we can all mm -hmm. buy one. I should just send you one if I was, you know, the amount of work you've given me. I should really just bloody send you one um, for free. But you never know your luck. You never know your <laughs> luck. Um, so, all right. So that's the license in the music. Now, you like to travel and recently you went to Ireland. Will Ireland feature in, in an upcoming book? Yes. And that reminds me, I've got to send an email to our driver from Ireland, uh, Day, uh, Mike Costello, not to be confused with Costello, because he, he oh. said everybody says the name wrong. It's So anyway, when I went to Ireland, and I, I need to go back, because basically this was like a tour on steroids. It's the best way to describe it. So I didn't realize, so I worked with a tour guide, and it was great. 
it's almost like the Ireland tasting menu. But everybody kept saying Ireland is so small and you're going to get to see more than you think. But it was so fast. It's like, okay, now you're in Dublin. Now we're in Dingle Peninsula. Now we're in Kerry. Now we're, you know, a giant's causeway heading toward Derry. It was like so fast. So I need to go back now. I, I have, I created a video where, where, with my travel buddies. I traveled with um, some women. It was for my 50th birthday. And I said, send me photos. And I took some footage and I created a video, but I also listed all the places because I knew I'm not going to remember everything. And I like put a star next to the places I want to go back to. But anyway, the, this driver, Mike, knew everything about history. In fact, he's somebody I got to talk to before book. Uh, just because the book takes place in 1998 and things are were way different in Ireland than they are now. So I need a historical perspective. But anyway, um, I was taught when we're driving, my friend Anastasia said, oh, Danielle's an author. And this guy was an avid book reader. And he's like, what do you write? He's like, well, tell me about the next book. He's like, I'm going to show you something. So we took a detour. We actually drove past this mansion in, in Leitrim. And he was like, and we were going someplace else. And he's like, is this the kind? Is this what you see in your book? I said, I do now, <laughs> you know, but it was you know a lot of it was research ahead of time and i was glad to know that i got some of it right um not a ton in this book but the third book there's going to be more so it also could be an excuse to because i really want to go back I just, and it'll be I tax wanna, deductible I'll, now though won't it now it's in the book i will find out and let you know of course it will of course it will yeah. it's research for your work yeah it's I definitely a tax deduction you know, I have another idea in addition, and really it all is just to, is all to try, you know, fund my travel because I want to go, I, I envy people who've gotten to travel around the world. So I want to go to England. I have been to France. I want to go back there. But I want to also see not just like London and Paris. I want to see like some of the surrounding areas and the countrysides and the stuff that not everybody takes the time to see. you got to see and Liverpool I, if you're coming to the UK. Got to go to Liverpool. Okay. Okay. Got to go to Liverpool. Okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. And then, um, you know, in Italy, I've never been to Venice and Tuscany. And so those for some reason are at the top. You've gone to Italy. Italy. Florence, Florence is a good one, too. Florence, yeah. Florence is like Venice, but without the canals. It's, and Michelangelo's <laughs> David is there. And it's just wonderful. Yeah. Florence is wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. anyway, you know, I just feel like I want to catch up on some, uh, some stuff. And, but yes, this is a good excuse. And I don't want to be strictly a uh, Google Traveler. In fact, I don't remember the name of the movie. There was a cornball romance, romantic comedy where the guy was going to take his bride to this place that he had written. Or no, she decided they're going to honeymoon on this place that he had written a series because he was a writer about. And then they get there and it's nothing like what he had written about. And they said, well, didn't you grow up here? And you find out he like Googled the whole thing. He'd never set foot in the place. <laughs> right. So I'm like, I don't want to be that. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, you want to talk. You want to you want to move the reader or the listener in the same way that the place moved you. You want yeah. to transmit that feeling because that's what art is. Yeah. What? Well, my that definition of eloquent. art, my definition of art because people go like, what is art? And I don't, I've not heard anyone else use this, but maybe I've stolen it from somewhere. I don't know. But as far as I'm concerned, art is something that moves you, yeah. which means a beautiful painting or a beautiful sculpture, if it moves you, it's art. And that goes back to the art being in yeah. the eye of the beholder. But it could be a brilliant goal that uh, Darwin Nunes scores for Liverpool. It could be a car that's just wow or it could be something that, then it's as far as i'm concerned it's all art and the people who create it are artists yeah. as long as it moves you that's for okay, me okay well i don't know if they're moved in the same way that ireland moved me there's going to be a lot of swearing because apparently <laughs> when i'm awestruck apparently i swear so okay i did not know this about myself Right. So we get to Dun Quinn and we're climbing down this cliff. And, and I mentioned my friend Anastasia, there were, there were four of us on the trip, but she and I were like the hikers where we'd want to do something and Mike would be like, that's really steep. It's going to be really hard to get back up. And Anastasia's like, challenge accepted. And I'm like, oh, crap, that means I got to go too because I'm not going to let her go by herself. So we climbed down Dun Quinn and we turned the corner and, you know, and there was like this beautiful cliff, just like you'd see on TV 
or on a postcard, but it was right in front of me. And I'm like, holy mother of blah, 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 blah. Do you believe this? And I literally like at this out. Well, you were moved, clearly. <laughs> and she just started cracking up. And apparently that wasn't the only time I get to Giant's Causeway, Cliffs of Moor, and I'm like, um, oh, Dunluce Castle, when you look down at the water and the rocks. But have, have you been to, to these places I'm talking about? No, I've been to I've been to Dublin and I've been to Galway. And I've got lost okay. driving between the two uh, overnight in the rain. So, no, okay. I, I don't know okay. Ireland well at all. Okay, no. so so um, Dunluce Castle and Giant's Causeway. Somebody told me that there's a, a place near the Cliffs of Moher that's less touristy that's really beautiful. But anyway... The point is, I'm awestruck again, and every single time it was like, holy. <laughs> <laughs> so if people read book three and start cursing, we'll know. They were they were moved in the same way. Yeah, I mean, that, that happens at Liverpool matches when things don't go well. <laughs> you hear a yeah, bit of that. Most people don't curse when, they, when they're happy, right? No, it's the other way around. <laughs> But that just shows you that it definitely moved you. There's no doubt about so that. So if I start cursing at you, you'll just know it's because I care. Apparently. I've moved you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an artist. Um, and so is this the book that's about a cult? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So this now. is book two. Yes. Ah, because in book one, the main character is based on you because you'd lived in New York City and you grew up in a cult. So what yeah. have you done? Have you gone back in, t in time or something okay. in this world? So um, not further back in time. So the first book's 97, this is 98. And I will say that this is embellished. This is not how I grew up, but there is a lot of accuracies in it. But it's not, as I've said before, I, mine was kinder, gentler. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a kind of gentler doomsday cult. Exactly. So, you know, um, a lot, you know, you, ha you still have like the brainwashing, obviously, but we weren't like living in a commune. They weren't like beating us on a regular. Anyway. It wasn't Jonestown. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, I embellished and added in what I know about cults in general. And my husband said, you might want to change a couple of these details because he was actually worried that somebody might come after me if I put it in the book because some of these place, people do not like being mentioned and I'm not going to mention them. So I had to change a few details. He's like, you're a little too accurate. <laughs> so what, were you um, getting it? Why was it sounding like the Scientologists? I'm not getting into which ones it sounded like, but it <laughs> sounded like. <laughs> no, but it's well known that they get upset. When, when people yeah. say things and do things that they don't like. Yeah. So I'm not going to, I'm probably, even, yeah, you I quickly change why. the subject or at least move us on a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But the thing that I, you know, when I bring it up, um, and I don't know if I'm ever going to write this as a nonfiction and, and actually uh, talk to different researchers who are experts in cults, because to me, a religious cult is only one type. You know, we see that kind of cult mentality in uh, politics. We see it in business organizations. We see it in cultures and in families. Like, to me, what's more dangerous is people can look at the way I grew up and said, ha ha, you grew up in a cult. But I can identify around me. I'm like, I have a very uh, strong cult meter. If I walk into a room and everybody's chanting the same thing and it could be just some kind of coaching guru that everybody loves, and I'm like, this is really weird. <laughs> you know, yeah. Or if they're chanting if something like, lock her up. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. they may be in a cult. And the irony is that he might get locked up now. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. But that that is very... That I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they turn on people who attack them or, or people who we don't attack them, people who question them. You they know. turn. And on. you, I know that you love, you know, Liverpool football, right? But I'm I've told you sure before, it's the closest thing I've got to a religion. Team. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, what's this? It, it's the closest thing I've got to a religion. Yeah. 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 But you're not going to beat the crap out of somebody who's on the other team, I would assume, or, or believe or like the I, other I'm, team. I'm. I, I'm not going to do that, but there are people who take their fandom of their football club that seriously. 
the, right. it was so a big, been, big yeah. problem in the 1970s and uh, a little part of the 80s here. It's, it's yeah. largely gone, particularly from the bigger clubs, but it still exists uh, throughout Europe and maybe South America. And, I don't know about South America, but, but yeah. indefinitely so throughout Europe. I'm not saying Europe. that you belong to a cult. That's not what I'm saying. But that cult mentality for people who go to that extreme, that yeah. to me is like a cult mentality. And you people can have it for anything and for many different reasons but it would be interesting to explore the mindset of people who get into that way of thinking and i and i will say and i don't say it i'm i'm very careful when i talk about because i actually i think your interview was the first time i talked publicly about growing up in a cult and it wasn't even that i was necessary i don't know maybe i was embarrassed about it because there's always this shame of like, oh, that's really weird. You're really weird. Well, guess what? But you were now a kid. You you had nothing to yeah. do with it. You didn't. Yeah. You're not the one that put you in that position. I don't know if your parents are still alive, but if anyone should be embarrassed yeah. about it, it should be them because they made the uh -uh. conscious choice. Yeah, they are not. Um, both my parents have passed, but there's. I'm trying to think of the best way to ex express this. When I talk about it, it was weird because I thought it was a different experience that people that made people uncomfortable if I brought it up and people I felt like didn't understand me because I I walked out of my church. Nobody stopped me at 19 and a half years old. I probably could have benefited by talking to a therapist. But number one, I had no money. We were taught don't trust anybody outside the church. You go to the ministers and there was such a such a stigma of talking to somebody so i probably could have done that but it's like what's in the family stays within the family you know so um there's a situation where there was literally nothing stopping me from going out and seeking somebody like another perspective so I, it took me a lot longer to can i say shit on your show <laughs> it took me a lot longer to can. get my shit together yeah, <laughs> then I think but but I think a lot of it, yeah. and and I don't know whether it's a cult or not, but people who are in uh, relationships with narcissists now, whether that's a narcissistic parent or a narcissistic partner, well, yeah. they're going to get that, and it's like the old thing about the elephant with the rope and the chain. You know, the thing where the the elephant yeah. is always uh, chained. You know, somebody sees a a circus elephant, and and he's only just there's a stake in the ground, and there's a rope around his leg, and they're thinking, well, why is the elephant not trying to get away? He could easily pull that rope. He's an elephant. Yeah. You know, they're so strong. Yeah. And the thing was, he's always been chained up, and he realizes that there's no point getting away because if he tries, he won't be able to, or he'll get hit or something if he does. And the yeah. truth is, he could get away, and that is how narcissists bind. And and there might be narcissists and yeah. cults might be the ultimate narcissistic environment. Oh, I, I don't know. The leaders, the leaders for sure. Yeah, and, and it might be yeah. part of that. Is it's like that? It's a, it is a real boundary, but it's not real. It's not physical. It is no, because it's, it's you've always been told. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a mental and emotional boundary. It's nar narcissists. They like, hate themselves. You take a look at. I don't. I don't care. People are gonna hate me for saying this, but um, I mean, Trump is like textbook narcissist, according to yes. Harvard, textbook narcissist. Yeah. And at his very core, he's afraid of everything and deeply insecure. So he comes across as this bloated, you know, lack of empathy, has no regard for cause and effect, cannot take on somebody else's perspective at all, and um, does a lot of damage and doesn't even realize it. <laughs> So. I think they realize it because narcissism is narcissism is not a mental disorder. It's a personality disorder. They're not. This is not an illness. I think they know that the uh, things they do are do you wrong. Think th I think they I know. Do you think they know they're narcissist or do you think they no. know the controlling part that you think they know that they're they, they know they're when they do they do things. Uh, I mean, I don't know about Trump, but I know that. When narcissists, you know, because I worked in broadcasting for a long time. So you met a few of them. <laughs> I, 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 one guy I'm sure was beyond narcissist. I think he was a sociopath. But most, yeah. most of the people I worked for had at least narcissistic tendencies. There were exceptions, but way more. There was a way higher percentage in people who run organized 
And this is well yeah. known that there, in, in broadcasting, in the people who are in charge, there is a higher percentage of people who are narcissists in those positions. Yeah. And I think they know when they're holding you back or when they're doing something because they, you know, there was an old thing in radio. The biggest award in radio was the Sony Award. And usually when you won one, you got fired. You did. It happened to me. I won. Yeah. It's the biggest award in radio in British radio. It was the Sony Award. Jonathan Coleman, who I ended up hiring many years later, he won one at uh, Virgin and got fired. And then he went to Hart and he won yeah. one there and then got fired. He used to call it the curse of the Sonys. And so many people, because the management can't handle them getting all this attention when the attention is supposed to be on them because yeah. they feed, yeah. they need supply. They need, And most of the people in broadcasting are failed broadcasters and they've got an immense jealousy for the people who are successful broadcasters who are earning more money than them and they're supposed to be their boss. You know, and, there's, and so there's all this, the dynamics there. But I'm sure I believe... And I and I'm sure it could be backed up that they know that when yeah. they when when you like I I put an award the year after I won the Sony I went in the Sonys again and I put the awards entry tape in and you have to have a blurb that you write with the Sony yeah and I wrote the blurb and this guy took the blurb out and wrote another blurb that said like we didn't always get the tone right and I was like. What the hell's this? This is for the the biggest award yeah. ever. You don't give them any negatives in your blurb. You try to highlight the things for them to listen to, to yeah. steer them to to the thing. And it, the whole thing had like loads of negatives in it. He didn't do that because he was an idiot. He did that so I wouldn't win again. He definitely did. Yeah. You know, that's what you're dealing with. And I'm also curious. And while we're on the subject, I have to. I will look it up and let you know what I find. So this was my. My Valentine's Day present, John asked what I wanted, and I said, I wanted the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders. So I Who said romance is dead? <laughs> every level of narcissism, but I'm also curious about like histrionic and like when you mentioned personality disorder, like I'm curious how many of them are narcissists and how many of them are severely depressed, like bipolar or if they have more than one or like histrionic or something else. Because as you're talking, like I can think of how that same situation applies in business and in relationships. Like, and you, I know got married young, you were very lucky, you guys got it right the first time. Um, I mean, I've only been married once, but it took a while to get to that point. But um, I can think of relationships in the past where I would date somebody who was like, if I would, thought I wanted to leave this job and go back to school so that I can better myself and do this thing. They would talk about all the reasons why, oh, that's not going to work. That's a bad idea. You're not going to, right, push you down. But they weren't doing right? that to help you. They were doing that to help them. Because if you the got control. this, there was a negative. Right. It was, it was, yeah, yeah. But and they know they know that they're, said, that's why they're doing it. They, it's not yeah. People who are mental don't know that they're doing bad things. These people know. Yeah, I don't think this person knew. That's what makes me wonder what the, the grades are. Because I don't know. If because I would leave, then all of a sudden it was like this. If I were down on myself or I was depressed, then he'd tell me, oh, these are all the reasons why you're so wonderful and great. But did he, right? did he use phrases like, no one will love you like I will, like I do, and things like that? That's no. very controlling. Okay. Okay. No. I, I don't did know. have somebody I dated once talk about messed Well, this is messed up in a different way. This wasn't narcissism. This was in college where somebody said that the last girlfriend who bro broke up with him, he ended up checking into a mental hospital because he want threatened to kill himself. So, and then he goes, so don't leave me, okay? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like right. the last girlfriend le left and I threatened Well, no, that's myself. that's don't that's severe me. depression, isn't it? And that's that's a mental thing, yeah. yeah. But narcissist narcissism but, is different. But you get the controlling, you get some of that yeah. deep insecurity. So, but yeah, you're talking about, like when you said, and you think they always know. I'm curious how much because because I go back and forth because Trump's an idiot. But there's part of me that wonders how much of it is just he's just playing an idiot. <laughs> how much of it is real? He, no, he knows. He knows what he's doing. Do so you he, think he's he, not as stupid as he pretends to be? Uh, he, in, a, in a way, I don't think he's <laughs> I don't think he's, he's Einstein, but uh, he knows what he's doing. They know what they're doing. 
Yeah. They, like uh, in business, I, I you, you can probably relate to this. The last one, I, I know, I, again, I go down these rabbit holes, sorry, but I worked for, I won't t tell too much about the company. I was doing freelance work and the owner, and we had, there were several uh, entities in his business and he would pit people against people. Like he would come in and create chaos so that people didn't trust me and I it's didn't It's called trust triangulation. Them. It's a ta it's a tactic called triangulation. And a narcissistic narcissistic parents will do it too if there's two siblings yeah. They will try. They'll they'll pit them against each other. It's so that they're not. And so they don't. To, yeah. But do they do it to go in and clean up after? Like you need me. No, to they do it and... because they do it because narcissists, they need supply, they need drama going on, they need yeah. drama. They feed off supply. So a a narcissistic mother, a narcissistic yeah. mother will say things to to they'll, they'll say you know i think your sister thinks that you should be doing more for me so that you don't so mm -hmm. it's clearly coming from the narcissist but it means that you will have a go at your sister yeah and she'll enjoy the she'll sit back and enjoy the battle between the two of them you know yeah. that's I've that's seen how they work in, they need supply yeah. they need this drama going on to but feel to important there's also that, is there a savior complex with that too, right? Or is it different? Mm. That's what makes me wonder if it's something different that, that I'm thinking of. Because okay. I've worked in two environments where somebody would go in and create all this chaos and say, oh, if I weren't here to, to save the day, you guys couldn't get any of this done without me. Like it needed to feed their ego. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know a manager. I know a manager of a, of a group of radio stations and his son worked for that group of radio stations and his yeah. son actually started running one of the radio stations and the son the, the station that his son was working for was doing very well running this particular station yeah. and another radio station in the group that this guy was the in charge of the group wasn't doing so well and he actually said out loud one day how many bloody kids do i have to have to save this network and he wasn't joking <laughs> He wow. meant it. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. You but you've done your ho more homework on this than I have. <laughs> well, you, you get to a point in radio where you you have to try to. I was at the time I was trying to learn their playbook, so I could fight it, not realizing yeah. you can never win. You can the yeah. only the only way to deal with a narcissist is zero contact and that doesn't mean that well, it doesn't matter whether it's yeah. uh, a, you've got to leave that business you cannot stay there or you've got to you know disconnect yourself from that relationship or from that family yeah. if it's your family of origin it's the only way to stop yeah. to stop just being used for their supply you have to stop yeah yeah i have to look up what percentage i, I bet you chat gpt could tell us what percentage of the population <laughs> Are not are narcissists the different type? Because I know there are different types. And yes, there's covert sure, narcissists and overt narcissists. Yeah, there's lots of yeah. different ones. Yeah. Yeah, and very few go for uh, help because they don't think anything's wrong with them. <laughs> oh no, no, they no, they're convinced there's nothing wrong with them. It's everybody else. Not this. Nothing's ever their fault. They're always but looking to blame. Yeah, but what's important to me as far as coaching, when I know somebody has that experience, I'd like to. Under, I still need to understand it better because I'm not dealing with their their parents, their family, whatever. I'm dealing with their fallout. I'm dealing with the ang well, you know why why are they anxious? Why do they have so much self doubt? Why you know? Probably because they're still in contact with the narcissist. The only the only answer is zero yeah. contact. Um, it is the only answer. And, well, and if you I grew up if you grew up in a narcissistic family, yeah. you're going to mentally see that as home and so when you're in a relationship and you start being treated that way you're not going to think of it as unusual yeah. and you're not going to for instance if you, if you came from a narcissistic family and you're sitting with your wife and one day your mother in front of your wife says you know we never wanted you to get married years after you've been married and yeah. you don't feel anything. You don't feel anger or anything. You just go, and then years later you go, 
wow, she was so out of order. Why didn't I call her on that? It's because you've been trained to just accept that that's so, okay to say yeah. when it isn't uh, yeah. ever. And so and it wasn't so you even holding it wasn't even holding back a response. It was just not even thinking of. There was not no even feeling that. that. Not even thinking huh. that that was even in the wrong. It was just like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Hmm. So, yeah. So, audiobooks, eh? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, one final thing I wanted to say, just, you know, when you say they haven't gotten away from them, even after you get away, there's still work. You know, there are family members that I haven't talked to in a very long time, not narcissists, but for other reasons. So when people go through, whether it's abuse or like this type of conditioning, you know, you're talking about narcissists, but if somebody came from domestic violence um, or physical abuse, sexual abuse, and they get into relationships and they think that's normal yeah. to be treated that way. They're institutionalized so or conditioned. And, yeah. and even getting away, just you're still, there's still like a recovery process. Yes, you know. once they've got away. Yes. And yeah. that will go on forever. That will ne that will always be there. That will be always something they have to work on. There'll be things that they get triggered by um yeah. be because it reminds them of, you know, a situation. Or, you know, yeah. It'll always 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 be there. And they have yeah, to work through it. I hope not an I hope not an always. Like I know what pushes my buttons <laughs> as far as like things that I don't I, they're not like a trigger like I'd get super panicky but I would just get annoyed like there are yeah. certain songs that annoy me why and why do they annoy songs you that, because when you go to a church function and you couldn't play certain rock songs because you know they were satanic music so you got to hear you know songs like celebration celebrate good times every time I hear that song I'm like damn I hate that song and it's nothing against the song, except that is one of like a short list of songs that they were with, allowed to play. So you go to a church event and if the church event was three hours long, the playlist is short. So you'd hear the same dance song like four times. Yeah. So, yeah, there's yeah. certain ones that. Uh, but was it was it a loving environment, though? I think my parents were loving people. Yes. Um, do I think the church is loving? No, they love bomb you when you join. Oh, but did you God, did you me. feel because you say you were in dodgy relationships? Were you looking for love, and were you blind to some of, you know, for want of a better expression, betrayal? I don't mean necessarily betrayal with another person, but just things that they do that are not when you're supposed to be together as a team. And and there's a there's a did you suffer from like a betrayal blindness? Because you just did you gaslight mm. yourself because you wanted this to be mm. what you were looking for and wanted to feel love, and you were just kind of just ignoring the things that were should have been red flags because you desperately needed that love. I think I ignored the red flags because I was poorly socialized. That's my case. So I don't, I would never say, like, I know my parents love me, full stop. I would never say that they didn't love me. I know they did the best they could possibly do for me. Do I think my dad probably, I don't think he was a narcissist necessarily. He had some, he probably had a personality disorder. I'm not sure what. Um, I'm pretty sure my mom had some type of anxiety, depression, because, you know, when you're told the entire marriage, you know, God comes first and you come second. And, you know, when you join that religion, this is the woman's place. Um, and she's already living in a time period because they got married in 1957 where women had very specific roles. Of course, you're going to be anxious and unhappy because you're told this is the life you get. You get to choose. Here are your options. You can be a secretary. You can be a teacher. You should be a mother. That's that's what you get. You know, he's the man. You do what he says. So anyway, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record because we talked about it before. Um, in our case, when you went to church events, you dated widely. So you had group dating. And then all of a sudden, when you're 18, then then you're supposed to go find somebody and get married. But it had to be somebody in your church and your pool is really small. And you couldn't there was no like interracial relationships. So now you've got like a very small population to choose from. And they weren't that great. <laughs> right? <laughs> And all these things that you're not allowed to do. And then all of a sudden you, you know, you leave and you get out there. And, and like you say about the elephant, you're free. It's, I, I don't think 
yes, I was looking, yes, I was highly insecure. Um, so yes, I was definitely looking for love and looking for validation, like, okay, because that, but that's also, this is multifaceted, um, because culturally, what were the romantic comedies of the day growing up or the fairy tales of the day? The Prince Charming comes and saves you and takes care of you. And this is what you should expect. Even in romantic comedies, the guys, I don't know if, you, I love the movie Romancing the Stone, right? But he treats her like crap. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he falls in love with her and he's like this great guy. Well, he's a great guy to her, but he's probably an ass to everybody else still, yeah. right? But you grow up being taught that this is what to look for in relationships. That was a really long answer. I'm sorry, but <laughs> yeah. So you what you so you were you were just poorly educated on on what you deserved yeah. really from from a from yeah. a relationship. Yeah. And you know, and any kind of church like you get two sides of it. On the one hand, like and again, this is not limited to a cult. I mean, this is limited to any kind of um I think abusive, dysfunctional social environment culturally in your family. But um, I totally forgot what I was saying again. <laughs> you, we were, well, well I, I was just saying, did you feel that the, they'd given you some, um, some, some, some rules about how life was going to be, and yeah, you were, yeah. you you were trying to break away from that, but they were still there. Those those boundaries yeah, and those it, restrictions you can, you can yeah you can declare i don't believe this right so you're when you're told um from the time you're born satanist demons are going to come to get you and armageddon and the world's going to end so when you're you know a four-year-old kid afraid to go to sleep at night and i would literally try to stay awake as long as i could because i would have these horrible nightmares about like wars and violence and i wasn't even exposed to that on tv i don't know how it was in my head but i would have all these violent which is I know you don't believe in past lives, but that's what makes me think there's something to it because of the, these kind of dreams I'd have. But, you know, when you're told, you know, from the time you're born, you're probably going to die in a violent way, you kind of messes with you a little bit. So mm. now you go out in the world and you're kind of afraid of things that most people would not be afraid of or extra you know, so I, I'm I'm making myself. But sound you basically crazy. went, but you basically went zero contact. Once you'd done that, did you feel like it's just a huge freedom to because you could make your own decisions now and decide instead of being told what was right and wrong, you could use your own morals to okay. to, it, to, okay. to do so that. Okay, so varying family members were were limited contact, no contact. That's a whole other uh, family story. So I wouldn't say there are certain people that are no contact. There were some that, well, now my parents have passed, so it's not really a, a, an issue. So that's a little, it's, it's a little hard to answer from that perspective. Well, were there um, other family members that were acting as, in narcissistic circles, they call it, that were acting as flying monkeys on behalf of the, the narcissists or whoever was at the center of it and kind of, getting you to, you know, you should really call them. You, I can't believe you haven't done this. And Were you getting any of that? No. Okay. Our family was truly unique. I, I know right. what you're talking about because I've heard it with other people. And actually, um, we were pretty close when we were kids. So I can't say that. No, it, it was a special brand of dysfunction. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, but what, I, but what I'm getting at is um, when you talk about getting into relationships and looking for, you know, there was there's no question that I was deeply insecure and you need the validation. And as I was talking about in culture at the time, if you didn't have a man loved you, you're worthless. Right. So find a man as quick as you could. And even if he treated you like crap, it's like, OK, at least you've got a man. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Aren't you lucky, Graham, though? You found Julie right from the get because you guys were really young, right? Uh, well, I, I didn't think so at the time. I was ready to get I was 23. Julie okay. went, no, when I met Julie, I was 21. And Julie okay. was 17. When yeah. we got married, Julie was 19 and I was 23. Yes. Okay. But, but we, met at a, we met at a wedding, which is yeah. quite romantic. Yeah. 
Because you mm-hmm. were a hooligan. I remember the story. You I said was you, you crashed. Nobbling. Crashed. Well, I, well, I was a wedding. I crashed, yes. Yeah. And uh, I saw her on the dance floor. But we'd actually met about an hour before that, I think. Um, we were outside. Um, the, the groom who I knew, although I wasn't invited to the wedding, but I knew him. And he um, he had a white Hillman Hunter car. And me and my friends were outside nobbling the car. You know, we were tying tin cans on the back of it and what have you. But, you know. So you were a hoodlum in more ways than one. <laughs> we, were drawing, we were drawing giant penises on the side of the doors with lipstick. And we'd run out and of lipstick. And you don't even know these people. Well, no, I knew the I knew the groom, but yeah, I knew him, and and um, we'd run out of lipstick, and two girls walked forward, and I said, "Excuse me, girls, you got any lipstick? We've run out." And it turns out that was Julie and her friend. I didn't know at the time, and Julie was like, uh, apparently said something like, "Oh wow, he's English." It's because this is in New Zealand, and her friend's like, "Yeah, so what? Lipstick drawing? Look at they've done that car." But anyway, so anyway. In the night, you know, I met Julie and we got talking and whatever. And I didn't have a car at the time because I was a big drinker and uh, I didn't spend a day not having a drink. So a car would have probably been lethal. But anyway, didn't have a, a and I'm a well, I'm a pipe fitter on a construction site at the time. And uh, I said to Julie, I said, well, uh, could you give me a lift home? Because I'm living in digs. I was living with an old Scottish woman in the, like a boarding house situation. Well, it was actually, I knew her son, Peter Brown, and I, I'd know where to live when my parents went back to Britain. And he said, oh, my mother will take you, and she takes in lodgers. So anyway, I was living there. And so we got in her friend Loretta's Mini, and not the current BMW Mini, the old British Mini, Mr. Bean car, tiny little car. We get in that, and we're driving out the car park of this, where the reception was, this hall. And we see this Hillman Hunter, and it's just a mess. And the bride and groom had left few hours earlier we'd nobbled the wrong car somebody went to a wedding <laughs> so you're drawing out. okay so you're cra- let me let me let's recap you're yeah crashing a wedding you're yeah. probably drunk you're oh definitely symbols on somebody else's car and yes. julie said that's the man that's for the man for me yeah <laughs> that's when she knew <laughs> <laughs> because of the because of the accent in the voice the voice but probably i don't i don't know I don't know. Um, yeah, and it was it was just really lovely. It was really nice. And she wasn't like any of the girls I'd had relationships with before. Uh, she was really quite interesting. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and we went, we went okay, for dinner. Okay, so tell, tell, okay, so you have to, right. you can't just stop there. So how was she different from all the girls you met before? She was just really nice and sweet and lovely and, then I got to meet her family who were Welsh and they were really cool as well and they were fun to be with and, you know, they were... And my parents were on the other side of the world. Uh, in my whole, I was there I, at that time. I was in New Zealand on my own. Yeah. And so it was like... And I'd, and I'd kind of worked out... When did they leave? I can't remember. They've been gone over a year, I think. And uh, I'd kind of worked out who I was and what I was on my own and liked it. And liked making my own decisions. And then uh, she was just, um, she was just lovely. She's just nice. And um, and it was pretty obvious that, you know, it was, she was going to be the one. And she seemed to feel the same way. And we went out and I wrote her songs. And um, it was the whole thing. It was the whole romantic thing. Right down to when we got married, we went up to... We decided we were going to get married. We were engaged, and we went up to the Bay of Islands, which is about an hour north of where we lived in Whangarei. Mm. And there aren't that many, you know, most of the buildings up there are made of wood. And uh, there's a little stone church on the waterfront in Pai here. And I said, that little, more of a chapel than a church, it was small. I said, that would be a lovely place to get married. She says, yeah. She says, but you probably have to be, you know a Christian or at least believe in God or certainly maybe live locally for them to allow that. So you even had the same or not belief. Lack of belief. Yeah. But but the same values, right? You had the same values and the same. Yeah. All that going on. 
And so I said, well, there's a phone number on this board. When we get back to your parents, we'll ring them and just ask. And the worst they can say is, no, you can't get married yeah. here. So we rang them up and it was we rang up this reverend. And it turns out this reverend came from Widnes, which is about three miles from where I used to live in England. <laughs> Yeah, and like she said, yeah, come and see me, and, she, and yeah, and we got married in this little church on the. Everything about it was all, was all everything was was proper romantic, yeah. Yeah, and she did. Was, you have any wedding crashers? No, we didn't actually. <laughs> no, um, yeah, because most of the people I hung out with, because this was on a construction site. Once the construction was finished, that you all get sacked. <laughs> story of my life getting yeah. sacked and so they <laughs> um they'd all they'd all moved to western australia they were in perth which is my, my i mean like eight or nine hour flight from where we lived in new zealand so they'd all gone there but i'd stayed in Wangarei because of julie and uh so i'm sure if any of them that i'd forgotten to invite w would have what at least at least five or six of them would have crashed it. So it was only because of circumstances, because that's the circumstance I was in, you know, because uh, we were all British. Uh, we all hung out together and, and we all worked on this construction. There was 2,000 men on the site at any one time. They were mostly men as well. So it was yeah. a very uh, blokey thing. But, you know, after, but, but after that, after being on my own and then meeting Julie and then, you know, I did all these things that I'd only ever dreamed of. You know, I got into a band and... Uh, I gave up smoking and I just became me. And then when we decided to move to Australia together three years after we got married uh, and I decided I came home from work one day, by that stage I was an air conditioning engineer. I said, look, what am I doing this for? I, I think I really want to be on the radio. And like a yeah. lot of wives would have just said, well, don't be so silly. Wash your hands, your teas on the table. She said, oh, yeah, I get that. Yeah, go on then. And like, yeah. you know, and that's the only, that's just that little push you need yeah. all the time. And she was always the one to do that, you know. Not and that here's why you shouldn't do that, which is what I got. <laughs> you did? What, no. When, From when a partner? I, yeah. That we were talking about somebody I dated where I'd say, I want to do this. Not, not now. No. Now I, you know, but back in the day, I tell, you know, I say, this is what I want to do. And here's all the reasons why that's not going to work. See, yeah. Was, well, what good is that to of, anybody? Like, yeah. So that's yeah. why it's worked. Yeah, and you were inseparable the, from the time you got you met to the time you got married. It was just like... Yeah, but there was a brief separation because, like I said, I was working at that refinery, but then when it came around to the end of the job, you all get fired and you get a big redundancy payout for, yeah. based on how many years you've been there. And so that was coming. And my parents are in Britain. And I was always going to go on a holiday to Britain with my redundancy money as soon as I was fired. That was just something I was going to do. And I had some friends from Britain who were going to, they met me bizarrely in Florida. So I was going to fly. And once we got to Florida, we'd have two weeks in Florida and we'd drive, rent a car and go oh, here, there and everywhere. And then we, I'd go to Britain and I was on a single ticket. And then when I'd had enough of that, I was going to go back to New Zealand to be with her. Now, when I met her, she was wearing this red dress. And so she was always known like to my mates, oh, the lady in red. And as soon as I got back to Britain, Krista Berg had a hit with the lady in red. Yeah. So wherever I went in Britain, every jukebox and every pub and on the radio and on the TV, lady in red. It was just like everywhere. And if you everywhere. believed in signs, which you don't, but if you no. did believe in signs, that would have it been was, it. It was everywhere. Yeah, so we, and we were apart for, I don't know, a couple of months, and then I went back, and that's when I really was on my own, because I went back, and I didn't have any work. I didn't have a job. I mean, I didn't have anywhere to live. Mrs. Brown had uh, taken some other lodger in and whatever. I stayed with Julie's parents for, I think, a week or so, and then I got in some other digs, and uh, and then I was kind of on my own. But then, you know, I, I, I got a job and ended up back at the refinery on the maintenance side because our old man helped me get in because he... Um, he was in charge of a, a part of that. And so that they helped me out with that. And then I got in a working, proper working band and then, uh, and then eventually into another band and, uh, you know, and things, things started really, uh, really going for it. And then we went to Sydney for a week on holiday and that was it. We came back and sold the house and about three weeks later we were living in Sydney. We arrived there. We didn't know anyone, not a soul. Yeah. I arrived with a toolbox well, and a suitcase. No, I didn't have any work. Oh, didn't have any work. Like we went there on holiday for a week and went. This is great. Oh, let's live here. 
okay. So we did. <laughs> it was just madness. Yeah, it was How a real adventure. adventure. And you had, and you said you had somebody who gave you lodging and somebody helped you get a job. So the point is you found the In right New Zealand, support. yes. Yeah, in New yeah. Zealand, yeah. yeah. But you found the right supporters, you found the right person so that you could become the person you were meant to be. And yeah. that's real. And when it, what's fabulous about yeah. that is it happened so young. Like you might not feel young at 23, but when, when I got married, yeah. People, yeah, when you, but it came together for you around that time. When you talk to people, 30s, 40s, 50s, who are not finding that, that right support group, that's really yes. rough. Yeah, because they're really on their own. And you do need someone, even if it's just a little shove, you do yeah. need just something. You don't need someone to be like waxing. Yeah, well, yeah, you should do that. You'd be great. You don't necessarily yeah. need all that. You just need like, yeah, yeah I get that. I, I can understand that. Why don't you do it? You know, because we were, once we'd, once because we, we bought a house in New Zealand, and once we'd sold the house or put it on the market and we were just renting in Sydney, it was just great. There was like no pressure. This mortgage thing didn't exist. You just had to make enough money for rent. And you were fine. And we had a great time. You know, I didn't have, a, I, I had a company van because I was air conditioning engineer, so we didn't even need to own a car. So we were yeah. living quite cheap, you know, so we could live in a, um, an apartment quite close to the city on the North Shore. You know, we didn't have to live way out west in the burbs. You know, we, we were right amongst it and we went and saw, you know, Eric Clapton, Paul McCartney, and anyone who came to town, we just went to the gigs, saw the Stray Cats at the Coogee Bay Hotel, and, you know, anything that was going on, we just, just went and were part of it. Was When we lived in little old Whangarei, it was a population of about 40,000. We didn't do anything. There was nothing happened there. I mean, the things that happened were when my band were playing. They were, they were the biggest nights out so, in town. You so know? you, Yeah, so you're self-motivated, and you didn't think... I'm going to, I could fail at this. You're just like, I'm going to do it. Right. With everything you wanted to uh, with, do, you just with, did. With the raid, with the radio thing, I made yeah. a conscious decision. I sat down one day and I thought to myself, how much do I really want to do this? And do I want to do it more than anything else? And I decided, yeah. And then I decided, right, well, nothing is going to get in my way. Yeah. Nothing. And then certain things happened very early on where obstacles come up and I just smashed them down. Like, for yeah. instance, I did because I didn't I didn't know anyone in Australia, never mind anyone in radio. I was an air conditioning engineer. And so I, I found out I did a course at a community college and I found out about com, um, a thing called community radio. And so I thought, well, this will be great. And I, I went down to the local community radio station. They said, oh, you have to do a course if you want to go on the air. I said, okay. I said, I've done a course, but I'll do another one. So I did the course, finished the course. At the end of the course, I said, right now I want an on-air slot. And they said, well, you have to wait till somebody oh, kind of dies because yeah. a lot of retired people worked yeah. on these volunteer stations or, um, you know, until somebody leaves or something. I didn't want to wait. I wanted to get on with it. So I packed, picked up their schedule and I found it because all volunteers, you don't get paid. I found that they were off the air between 2 a.m., no, between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., Saturday yeah. night, Sunday morning. Like yeah. between, So it's basically Sunday morning between 2 a.m., 6 a.m. So there's no one in that slot there. That's, they said, that's not a slot. We, we're actually closed down. We go dark doing that. So I'll go in there. And I went yeah. in there because I wanted to get on the air and get doing it. And then I wanted to take phone calls. And I said, how do you take phone calls through the desk? And they're I like, remember, we don't take. So, so I, so I, uh, I wired up a phone extension while yeah. the records were playing and got an answer phone with a speaker in it and put, put the guest mic in there. So there were just, <laughs> there were just things along the way that, that nothing was going to stop me. And then I got my big, big break was I got accepted at the Australian Film, TV and Radio School. Yeah. But, I, you know, during the interview... I went for broke because I didn't care. And I even said to them, I said, you know what? It doesn't matter if I get on this. I know this is the best course in Australia, but it doesn't matter if I don't get on this course because I'm going to do this anyway. You're not going to stop me. Yeah. So you might as well have me on the course. I mean, I was really arrogant when I think about it. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I remember, because I, I, I remember we talked about this before. In fact, I think that was a title when you, I'd had you uh, do a video for me when we I was doing a podcast. But I remember you saying that you had to set up to take the phone calls and then take it apart the next day before the Yeah, I had it, I had, you plugged it in. It was, yeah, it, yeah and then, yeah. And so no one could work out, that? people would hear phone calls on the air and not work out how the hell I was doing it. And I wouldn't tell them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So how did you have all that? But see, you have all that fortitude. Where did you learn that? Right. So the, the reason I'm asking that question, and it's kind of a rhetorical question, but you can answer if you want to. But a lot of people, you know, it sounds like and you haven't gone too much into your childhood, but I'm going to guess based on what you're saying, you know, your parents were narcissists, at least one of them. Right. Both. Um, 
They both not were. great family environment, not necessarily great, but yet you came out of it. You um, got into a fantastic marriage. You decided exactly what you wanted for yourself. You did not feel insecure. You, you're like, this is what I'm going to do. And you believed enough in yourself to do it. You had the support of people around you, like everything kind of not well, only. Well, I had one person around me, which was Julie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It didn't so have, there, didn't there was like no the other lodgers. people around. Hey? Okay. Oh, because hmm. you mentioned somebody helped you get a job and then there was somebody who gave you lodging. So they weren't. Oh, sure. Yeah. Were, yeah. Julie's parents helped her. But yeah, they, they were great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But you didn't. So you didn't feel like you had support from friends or anybody around you. Well, all my friends were in Perth and okay. uh, it, it, when I was in New Zealand. And then when we moved to Australia, there was just the two of us. We didn't know anybody yeah. there yeah, in Sydney. Okay. When they say all my friends went to Australia, they went to Perth, which is, you know, on the other coast. Uh, it's like going to New York and all your friends are in Los Angeles. It's like that's the distance. Yeah. And it wasn't like you had Zoom calls to chat with people every other day. You didn't even email. have email. No. Yeah. 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 So you had to believe in yourself because it's like, OK, if I don't do this, it's just not going to happen. As but it felt as... it felt like a midlife crisis at 27 for for getting into radio. Did it? It, it felt like like what's what's what are, what is my life going to be if I don't do this? I'm going to be fixing air conditioners for my whole, whole do I want to do that? And at the time, the bloke who ran I ended up working for a, the first company I worked for I didn't like, but then so I left and I went for another guy who was a small guy but he had uh, so many big jobs, all the government jobs, you know, where you get paid, all the courthouses and police stations in Sydney, all of them. Yeah. We did all the uh, heat and ventilate and air conditioning in all of those. And he was going to give me the, he, he sat me down one day, he says, mate, I'm going to retire. I'm going to give you the business. You, you can have the business. I said, well, you're going to want some money for this. This business must be worth something. He says, mate, I'll loan you the money. You'll pay me back and you keep me on as a consultant and I'll tell you what to do. Put Julie in the office and you'll, you'll be sweet, mate. Your ship's <laughs> come in. You're doing great. And I, and at that time I'd already decided I want to be in radio and yeah. I, I'd applied for uh, Australian Film TV and Radio School for afters, didn't know whether I was going to get in. And then they accepted me. And of course, this is six months full time, no pay. And you can't work, you're full time. I'm going to have to go six months with no pay. We had to move to a tiny little flat in Lane Cove because we couldn't afford the flat we were in near the city. And we had to uh, move there. And this place had cockroaches. And when we put the roach baits out, that's when we found out that the rats were eating them. I mean, this is a horrible little flat we were in. So was, Jul was, the... was Julie supporting? Was she working? Yeah. Supporting you? Like she, worked at a, she worked at a camera shop. It wasn't exactly where they yeah. developed film as well. It wasn't exactly lucrative. So we were even, we were broke. Um, and no car because I didn't have a company van. But anyway, when I said to this guy, I said, and he says, mate, yeah, you're, you're set to do this. And I said, uh, Rob, uh, I, I, I don't want to do this. So I want to be on the radio. And he looked at me and he went, mate, you're mad. You're mad. <laughs> you're out your bloody mind. You, what? And he, it just didn't make any sense to him. Didn't. But I knew what I wanted to do. I worked out that uh. you spend most of your day at work. Most of your waking day is at work. And I didn't like what I was doing most. I wanted to do something I enjoyed. And maybe that's just selfish or childish. I don't know, but I decided I don't. I I want to do something that I enjoy. And, and I, at the very beginning, I said to Julie, I said, "Look, I'm going to go for this with everything I've got. And if I can't be on the air, okay, well, I'll take a job behind the scenes as a producer or an engineer or something. Yeah. But I'm going to do this. I'm going to work in this business. And it turned out I worked on the air from the very first paying radio job I got. They were all on the air." I got a, sh a few where I were management, and usually I put myself on the air as well. But I never had to go, like, you know, work your way up from the very... I went in on the air. First job I got was a breakfast show. Um, yeah. Uh, paying job. So, but I just... There was, there was just nothing going to stop me. Nothing was going to get in my way, and I did. And I, you know, I was sending off and getting cassettes of, of radio jocks from all over America to listen to, to inspire me, to steal ideas and bits from. And I just went one hundred percent in. I was getting books and subscribed to comedy services and things. Where I was reading and writing everything I could, spending money, making up demo tapes and sending them to all different radio stations all over Australia to get to bigger stations. And and they all, with each one I worked at was bigger than the previous one. And yeah, it was just, just full on. It was just an obsession, um, completely full on. Did you yeah. take time to sleep and take a day off? <laughs> well, not really. I mean, my days off, I would be, you know, people would say to me, what are you doing on the weekend? And I'd, do sh I'd say show prep. And the salespeople would go, show prep? Yeah, prepping my show. I'm looking for material, 
things to talk about on the air and they'd be like, what? <laughs> yeah. I must have been really annoying. Yeah, but I just, but I really did love it. I loved it. I just, just being on the air, I just loved, but eventually just the, the bullshit from the management side of it, just absolutely, it took nearly 30 years. I was on the air for 29 years at uh, full time. And yeah. uh, then it just, in the end, it just wore me down. And, uh, and then the, the, my big break was lockdown. When lockdown yeah. came and I'd just been fired and no one was interviewing or anything and um, I had to work out quickly how to, because we got a big mortgage on this flat and I had to work out quickly how yeah. to to survive. Julie thought we were going to lose the flat when I got fired and that was before lockdown. And Was, uh, it, was said, it as stressful as when you were 27? Was it that same level of stress? It was different because when I was 27, it was it was a dream. Worst case scenario, I'm fixing air conditioners. When yeah. uh, when lockdown happened, it was like, how the hell do you make money without leaving the house? Enough to yeah. pay a big fat mortgage that you've, you're only like yeah. three years into. Uh, two yeah. years? No, three years, I think we were into it. No, yeah. we were in two years into the mortgage at that stage. And um, it was like, what am I going to do? And uh, and I looked and I, and I saw this audio books thing through ACX. And I, I auditioned uh, for three and I got one. I couldn't believe it. So I did it and I actually quite enjoyed it and met, uh, talked to the author online. And so then I started jigging my website. So it was more aimed towards that. And then, you know, I did some more and I did some more. And then, well, and then I thought, you know, and then, you know, maybe two years ago, because I've been doing it three years now, it was like, to hell with radio. <laughs> 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 to hell with working for those idiots and being told, yeah. you know, you know, having a whole meeting over why you said this joke at this time and you didn't play this track when you should have done this oh. or this line. Yeah. Oh, you've gone dark. I, I don't know. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you, but I can't see you. Okay. Yeah, I don't know where I went. Where are you now then? Because I still can't see I, you. An alternate dimension? I don't know. Jeez, what I happened? You must have turned I the didn't... camera off. Oh, oh, now you've gone all together. Wow. Well, I know I can go on a bit, but I didn't realize it was that boring. Well, let's see. Uh, let's see if she's going to connect back up again. Because that was not the way to go. Oh, here we go. Hey, so what happened? I don't know. Maybe the that's the universe's way of saying, or maybe that's Julie in the other room saying, gosh, Come to bed. talking too damn long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was different. But that that's that's really kicked on. And I wouldn't I mean, it'd have to be something very special to go back to radio full time. I'd take, you know, if someone was say to me to say to me, you can do because I did um, I did a fill in. I did a phone in show on Radio London a couple of times. And I really when I think about what, what I really enjoyed just talking to people on just just talk a talk show on the phone. Uh, I really enjoyed those shows if bbc london or one of the london stations said hey would you like just to do friday nights or saturday nights or something and the money was decent yeah i'd do that but but to, to actually rely on radio for full-time income every time yeah. i got every time i got fired um i couldn't get a job first of all you can't get a job in the region you've been fired in because you sign a no compete clause so you have mm -hmm. to move out of that to a radio station outside the market but uh, the first radio station I, I worked at in Britain was on the south coast. The next one was on the northeast, almost in Scotland. So it was like four or five hundred miles away. And then the next one was in the Midlands. And then the next one was not that far away. But then I went back to bloody Bournemouth. Bloody Bournemouth. I liked Bournemouth. It was great. But we moved, every time I got fired, we had to move. So we couldn't buy a flat or anything. The only reason why we managed to buy this flat was... Um, I worked in Hertfordshire, ran here, and I got fired from here, and then I got a job in London, and you can commute into London from here, so I commuted into London, so we could, we could keep that yeah. going, even though I was I changed jobs. That was the first time I changed jobs and not moved house. <laughs> it's like it's like. So what if, if you we learned fired, two things? Number one, yeah. with whatever happened in your childhood with narcissistic families, it prepared you for work with narcissistic people in radio, so you had a good career. Well, it it it, 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 gave it, it, no? it 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 didn't prepare me. It made me vulnerable to that because they see it. They 
I became a magnet for them because my reaction to uh-huh. them, instead of standing up and saying, you're out of order, no, I would okay. like comply and it would ruin my life. You know, if they said, if they said we, you're only allowed to talk four times an hour and you've got to do all this other stuff in between, then I'd go, okay, but then it would just eat me up. Whereas really I should have said no. <laughs> so what point, what point did you say no? Like Never. you didn't go your whole career like that. To lockdown? Uh, there, were, there were variations of me misbehaving, as they would uh, call mm-hmm. it, which would usually lead to me eventually getting fired. But So it never, I never worked it out. There's, there's two ways to deal with something. There's, the, you, can, you can deal with it well or you can deal with it badly, and I always dealt with it badly. Um, uh. And, you know. Um, you don't let audiobook produ- uh, authors push you around, do you? Like I said, Graham, I want you to I want you to work for a penny per finished hour. I, <laughs> I, I found working for audio book uh, authors and producers, I found that very occasionally, because usually it's it's a lovely relationship between the author or the right the rights yeah. holder and the, the and it's it's complimentary you know you you you, you I, I will go this is really well written and they'll go you've read that really nicely and you didn't get that in radio you never got yeah. compliments and whatever yeah by and large it, it was nice but sometimes i found and i worked out later that i was sometimes i'd get triggered there was a a, a situation once where i was working with an author and um i'd all the K was a fiction book, and all the characters I'd put in a Google Drive file for them to approve, and they approved all the characters and said, "Yeah, that's how that one, that one to sound, that's how one, that's sound." And we'd gone backwards and forwards on some of them, and we got them. I said, "Right, now we'll start recording the book." We started recording the book, and I'm about, I think, three hours in, and she says to me, "You know the voice you've got for that character, and the voice you've got for that. Vo- Can you switch them?" Meaning I'd have to go back through all this work. Yeah. And yeah. I went ballistic, and I just messaged her, and I just said, "I'm out." You don't owe me any money. I'm out. I'm not doing your book. And I know I reacted that way because I was triggered. Yeah. I was back in radio for a second. And I would thought I'd left that behind. Whereas yeah. now, now, do you know what? I just do it because I just get back to... Um, or or set a boundary, right? Well, you know, I, I might have, yeah, I might have said, yeah, I can do it. But you know what? It'd be nice if you gave me another finished hour for doing this because it's going to take right. my time. Yeah, I would deal with it. I would deal with it correctly instead of just spitting the dummy, as they call yeah. it in Australia. Um, and I did that, you know, I'd done 100 and, it's about 107, I think it's 167 audiobooks. Six times that happened in the, and it hasn't happened for at least a year. And I would just go, nah, and I just say no, and I'm out. And I was, and weirdly, and I, and I may have even spoken to you about this a while ago when we were first starting, I was actually proud of the fact, and, it was, and I thought it was great that I could do that, because I couldn't do that with radio. I couldn't go, I'm out, because then I'd have to move yeah. hundreds of miles. But yeah. I, I actually can do that, and I still have that power, and I won't use it anymore. I won't do it, because I think I was being triggered back to my yeah. past. So now, I, it, you know, it's either, well, am I going to just suck it up and do it and know that there'll be an easy book coming along? Or maybe I can talk to them and say, you know, this is going to take me a lot of time. I'm yeah. happy to do it, but you're going to have to pay extra. Yeah, because you know? yeah, it's amazing what people don't know about the work you do. You know, they'll sit in front of me, say, for coaching, and for the every hour, I'm still, there's an hour behind the scenes that they don't know about yeah. what's going on. Or yeah. for every hour that you, re- like, my favorite is if you look on Upwork and they say they want a voiceover artist, they want five minutes worth of work, and they'll say, okay, we'll pay you 10 bucks. But they want you to get on a Zoom call to have a discussion <laughs> about how the voice should go. Then they want to see your script. So in other words, if they want a five-minute written, say, YouTube script, you write the script with the scene direction, and then yeah. they want you to record it. This is just an example. They're assuming if it's a five-minute whatever that it's going to take you five to ten minutes. And like, I am I, sure so now... Educating people. Uh, yeah. I, I'm sure now that that lady, she wasn't, you know, uh, you know, I was triggered to the point of like, what am I, your bitch? Really? You know? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and and really what was going on, she had no idea. She had yeah. no idea that when I have to change a voice, that I have to go into that file, even if it's of changing three seconds of what, uh, then, then I have to go back and remaster the whole thing and then reload it to ACX. And I, yeah. for each chapter that that needs doing, she had, there's no way she knew. She was, she, I think she was the first time she'd done an audio book. And I should have known that. And I yeah. should have, you know, no, I didn't. 
you know, I didn't deal with it well. And the, I was that still that, you know, because I think I'm still doing work on myself. But I think at that stage, I, I remember, and I may have even spoken to you about, but I used to brag about the fact, this is way better than radio. If you don't like working for him, you just fire him. <laughs> it's just, and that's not the way to be. It's not, yeah. it's like, it's a really yeah, immature got, way to be, actually. You got in the middle. You got the trigger, and then you got to the other the side reaction. of it is doing whatever. Or you found that happy medium. But yeah, no, little, now now I just, I, you know, it has to be something, it does have to be something serious for me to go. No, it got, it, yeah. it's funny enough, it's funny enough it, that I, I got to like an epiphany when I was doing a, a religious book. Now, you know me, staunch atheist, yeah. but yeah. if they want me to do a religion book, I figure, well, I'm doing fiction anyway. I'll do it, right? And I actually quite enjoy them because they're almost Shakespearean. And when I do the scripture things, I put echo in it and I'm the voice of God. And anyway, I was doing this Christian religious book for a guy and he wanted me to change something and I'd read it exactly how he'd written it. And he wanted to rewrite it like completely, like a huge section of it and re-record it with this new script. And I was like, no. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not doing it and uh, whatever. So then uh, he came back and he said, like, really? And I said, if you want me to do that, and, and I wasn't nice about it, I said, you're going to have to pay me more money and whatever. And he came back to me and he said, no. And I realized that this book was about, I think it was like eight or 10 hours long. And this was like in the last two hours. And I sat down and I thought, look at the money I'm going to throw away. I can either do this exactly how he wants it to do these other two chapters again and get all the money for all these hours or I can tell him to get stuff and I'll get nothing which one makes more sense here I'm um, could do you know this was just this one so I just did it and then after I did it I actually felt pretty good <laughs> and I apologized to him and said you must think I'm an idiot well, I still think he was out of order but I dealt with it badly uh, I hadn't dealt with it well at all yeah but that that was the point when I thought why don't I just why don't I just do it? And um um and then some easy book will come along behind it. Yeah. And and if I am gonna ask them for more money, there's a much nicer way to do with it and educate them and everything, instead of just going, nah, you're gonna have to pay. <laughs> you know. And I think and I think that's where the change was. Yeah. Well, if I ask you to do stuff and you don't want to do it or you feel like I'm being pushy <laughs> Just you just communicate that. Well, we know each other now because it's different. We know each other now. And now yeah. I know but you're I, a pushover. It's like, let me see what can that's I. That's it. Yeah, I'll be if your I bitch. I want to see yeah. year old Erasmus Vandenberg. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Danielle, it's been great talking to you. Um, it's been quite therapeutic as always, and we've gone <laughs> every every which way almost. Um, but we did mention Data Collectors Trilogy is now out as a box set. <laughs> And there is the um, the combined wisdom and life experiences of people who've been through a lot in it, in your writing and in my characterizing people. So, uh, yeah, or coming out with the, the characters for them. So thanks once again. It's been fab. It's been really good. It's not what I expected, this chat. But then again. We never, we never do. We always have talking <laughs> points and we just. What's next for you? Give us, let's, let's tease ahead. Oh, jeez. I don't even know anymore. No. Um, well, so there's this book and then there's a third because apparently I write in three. So there'll be three okay. books in the series. Um, yeah. And then outside of that, I'm actually, this is a tangent we won't go down because I am actually creating a couple of programs on journaling uh, for stress and anxiety and studying cognitive behavior therapy. So if you want to, you know, I'm not becoming a therapist, but a practitioner to go along with the coaching. So Greg, you ever want to, have a coaching session with me, no charge. We'll get on a separate call. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't think I don't think you've got the time session. to hear all of my issues. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, well, it's great. Anyway, it's been great was, talking to you. Yes, thank you, thank you for. We always have a great conversation. I always we feel do. bad taking so much of your time, but it's always fun to chat. 